Live's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Yeah. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together, we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they would ah. wait the next week. You're all, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. Only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. It was the only time and the only opportunity he had to be on court his senior year. But what a moment it was that a video that's now gone viral, thanks to ESPN Sports Center. Nearly half a million dollars worth of stolen luxury cars discovered behind a motel in Metro Atlanta. How they ended up there? 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. First on your Monday night, new numbers, new restrictions, and new fears about the coronavirus. The CDC is calling this an unprecedented threat. There have been 17,000 cases reported of the coronavirus in China with 360 deaths. There are some uh, publications that are contending that it's even more than that. Now, here in the U.S., 11 known cases so far. Two of those people were infected by household members who had been to China on a trip. And very strict travel restrictions are now in place. Any American citizen or family member that has been to China in the last 14 days will be redirected to one of 11 hospitals for a full CDC screening. And tonight, there are fears of economic fallout from the spread of the coronavirus. Major U.S. companies now are seeing the effects of the virus, such as Starbucks and Apple as well. Atlanta area financial experts believe that if the spread of the virus doesn't slow down, everyday people will start to feel it as well. She knew her explains what this could look like. Well, yeah, guys, the financial experts are certainly speaking on this. They say at the East Paces group in Atlanta right now, impacts aren't big enough where the average person is going to feel it. But they say it can only stay that way if the number of infections uh, plateau where it is today and don't dramatically rise. The coronavirus has financial experts on alert, keeping their eyes on the stock market and investments. There certainly will be effects both nationally and just here in our home city if, um, if this virus isn't contained. Alex Reffitt is the co-founder of the East Paces Group, an independent investment advisory firm in Atlanta. He says if there are more infections of the coronavirus, the global economy and American companies will take a hit. Workers in China that are not working and you've got a huge manufacturing hub that's going to be affected um, and, and production levels are obviously potentially going to go down because of it. He says with how connected the world's economy is now, lack of production can create a negative sentiment about the Chinese market, which can hurt companies in America with Chinese ties. And if the coronavirus does not slow down, the effects can trickle down to Atlanta. We've got the CDC, you've got the busiest airport in the world. I mean, that obviously being in Atlanta, our team thinks about this a lot more. Travel and tourism are big industries here. Some major airlines have already canceled flights to and from China. 
Your personal finances can also be at risk. Your 401ks, your IRAs, your investments, um, you know, with when rates change, your fixed income investments uh, are affected. But will it get there? Refit says if things stay the way they are, then no. SARS is the last case he remembers like this, and he's confident this may play out the same way. Now, Redford says right now you're you'll more likely to see the effects of the S&P 500, the Dow Jones and the major industrial stocks, especially those that have some sort of relationship with China. Yeah, we are all interrelated as far as the economy goes all across the U.S. and across China. Thank you. Appreciate it, Chinook. All right. Another fire on I-85 today, just two days after that massive tanker fire shut down the interstate for hours over the weekend. Police say the fire today was caused by somebody in a stolen Dodge Charger who crashed into the back of another car near Jimmy, Bull uh, Jimmy Carter Boulevard this morning. The other car flipped over and then caught fire. The man in the stolen vehicle then ran off. Police are still looking for him tonight. Fortunately, everybody involved in this crash expected to be okay. The situation resolved much faster than that fire on Saturday, and Jennifer, you and I were here keeping an eye on that. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. It shut down parts of I-85 for about 10 hours. A fuel tanker truck crashed. It flipped over, then burst into flames. And you could see the smoke for miles. Two people died in the crash. The fuel from the tanker spread into the sewer drains on Crescent. And then people say they could see explosions coming from nearby manholes. An amazing sight. Rescuers not only evacuated drivers. How about that sight? It looks like the walking dead, doesn't it? Uh, the cleanup, the repairs, it all took hours. What a mess. What an event, an unexpected one on a Saturday morning. I had a guy email me that he was just going out for breakfast in Gwinnett County, and he found himself facing all of that on the interstate. Edwin Lopez spoke to GDOT today about the quick response to the fire and why workers were able to reopen the road a lot sooner than expected. We were thinking initially that it would be 8, 10, 12 hours of road closure. The whole thing was based off of what, how deep that the diesel fuel had run into the asphalt, and then also on how big of area we had to repair for that time. GDOT workers said they didn't know what to expect when they first arrived on scene and saw a truck on fire. When you start dealing with tractor trailers, you never know what's on the vehicle, and that's one of the things when the fire department rolled in, None of us had any idea what was on that trailer. Police say the Freightliner truck was pulling a fuel tanker with 8,500 pounds of fuel. The truck driver, Jonas Worku, apparently unable to stop before he hit Emerald Lynn's car, which was stopped in a right-hand lane from a separate accident. When the semi hit the car, they both burst into flames, killing both drivers. Police say the fuel then made its way into the drainage system, sparking multiple fires nearby and putting other drivers at risk. But they had to evacuate the cars uh, because they felt that they was in danger as well. Drivers jumping over the median, some leaving their cars behind, many stranded for hours while emergency crews got to work, clearing the wreckage and repaving the lanes. The repair work going faster than expected. As we took the layers off, we was pleased to, to note that the diesel fuel only penetrated the top inch and a half layer. Completely clearing all lanes on I-85, Barnes says it's a sign of the crew's quick response, a true team effort, all done to keep others safe. This guys did a great job. GDOT is working with Gwinnett on an I-85 corridor, and that's going to be a study to improve safety and ease congestion on the interstate. The first meeting will take place tomorrow in Norcross, and a truck lane is not off the table. We'll have more on that coming up at 9 o'clock. A former officer who pleaded guilty to attacking a man during a traffic stop could be called to testify against another ex-officer as he stands trial this week. That story topping our speed feed tonight. Cell phone video appears to show Gwinnett County Officer Robert McDonald stomp on Demetrius Holland's head during a traffic stop back in 2017. You might remember that. Officer Michael Bongiovanni is also seen punching Hollins in the face while his hands are up. Both officers were fired after the video surfaced and charged with assaulting Hollins. Bon Giovanni took a plea deal and was sentenced to work release and home confinement on one condition. He's now supposed to testify against McDonald in this trial, which started today with jury selection. A woman behind bars tonight accused of shooting and killing a mother at a Super Bowl party in southwest Atlanta. 26-year-old Rochelle Facey is in the Fulton County Jail right now. Police say the shooting stemmed from a fight at the party on Fairburn Road yesterday. Police have not released the victim's name, but family members have identified her as Tashika Sims.
And the city of Atlanta launching an affordable housing tracker. It's supposed to show the progress the city has made in reaching its goals of preserving 20,000 affordable housing units by 2026. It will also track how much money is being invested. You can find the link to that tracker right now on 11alive.com. Prosecutors will not seek the death penalty for two people accused of killing a Clark Atlanta student. Jordan Jones and her boyfriend, Baron Brantley, were indicted last week in Alex Crawford's murder. Crawford was Jones' roommate. Investigators say that Jones and Brantley killed Crawford on Halloween, then dumped her body in at Decatur Park. Brantley accused of sexually assaulting Crawford a few days before she was killed. This case and the violent details shocked so many viewers. And when we asked the Fulton County District Attorney if they will indeed seek the death penalty for Brantley or Jones, the answer was no. But then again, uh, the death penalty is not given by juries in Fulton County. It very, very uh, seldom. I think you have to go back to see if it's ever been done. Although the spokesperson, of course, uh, we are expected to hear from them at some point. Hey guys. We tied the record high temperature out there today. It really felt like spring. Our high today was 76 degrees, and the record for today's date is also 76. That was set in 1995. We should be around 54 degrees this time of year for our average high temperature. So as you can see, we were way above that average today, and we tied the record. Now, we're going to stay mild as we go through the next few days, but then the colder air is going to move in. So with this mild air that we're going to have on Tuesday and Wednesday with this southerly flow, it's also going to pick up some moisture, and that's going to increase our rain chances. And then as the cold air tries to come down again from the north and the west, that clash between those two air masses is just going to enhance the rainfall and also increase our storm risk from late Wednesday and through the day on Thursday. And then all that moves away uh, out of here, the rain will, and will cool down once we get toward the end of the week. Stay with us. We're going to break down the timing of the temperature changes and that storm risk in just a few minutes. Well, here we are, and it's the day after the Super Bowl. The Chiefs are world champions. They beat the Niners with a stirring comeback, 31-20. to 20. Man, they got it going with their great quarterback, Pat Mahomes. And now it is uh, the first time since 1970 the Chiefs have won a Super Bowl. But we know all of that, and we know that half of the fun certainly was beyond the game. It was the advertisements and the halftime show. So here we go. Let's recap some of the trending moments. Demi Lovato delivered a stunning performance of the national anthem to kick off Super Bowl night, one of her first performances since overdosing in 2018. The first woman to coach at the Super Bowl, Katie Sowers, made headlines, and her Microsoft ad let everyone know that women are ready to take the lead in football. A touching tribute, both teams honored the late NBA legend Kobe Bryant by lining up at the 24-yard line, the number that Bryant wore for a decade with the Lakers. Google had football fans reaching for the tissue box as it asked the question, how do we remember what's most important in life? Going into the fourth quarter with a 10-point lead, the 49ers felt pretty good. That is, until they let it all slip away. Falcons fans, they can relate. Kyle Shanahan is a familiar figure indeed. He was at the helm of the Falcons offense three years ago when they blew that 28-3 lead. This is Groundhog Day for him, without a doubt. Lil Nas X and Sam Elliott showed off their best Old Town Road moves for a bag of Cool Ranch Doritos. And the president has to delete his congratulatory tweet of the Chiefs after, well, a slight mishap with geography. We didn't forget about the halftime show either. Nobody did. Jennifer has covered that for us. Great show last night. Really a lot of fun, a memorable act. A whole lot of folks talking. J-Lo and Shakira rocked the halftime show. The ladies brought the heat, but it didn't come without controversy, <coughs> as usual. Well, some people loved it. Others say the performance was just too racy for what they called a family event. There is also a particular moment with Shakira that caught a lot of attention. That's what we're talking about. Social media exploding when Shakira did this gesture into the camera. It instantly became a meme. Some confused, others turning it into a joke. But while it may seem comical to those who don't understand, you should know that the gesture has cultural significance. It's called the Zahurata. And in some Middle Eastern and African cultures, women will make that sound as an expression of joy and celebration. You might hear it at weddings, parties, or other festive occasions. Shakira is Colombian and Lebanese, so it was her way of paying homage to her father's Lebanese 
culture. Another big moment from yesterday's game, the political battle happening off the field. Both President Donald Trump and Democratic presidential candidate Michael Bloomberg debuted campaign ads. I want to thank President Donald John Trump. Woo! This one, uh, this is one of two rather ads aired by the Trump campaign. It focuses on Alice Johnson. You might remember her story. She was sentenced to life in prison for a nonviolent drug offense. And with the backing of the president and reality star Kim Kardashian West, Johnson was released after serving 21 years. I heard Mike Bloomberg speak. He's been in this fight for so long, he heard mothers crying. So he started fighting. When Meanwhile, Democratic presidential candidate Michael Bloomberg's Super Bowl ad highlighted his efforts to fight gun violence. And in case you were wondering, campaign ads during the Super Bowl are pretty rare. According to USA Today, yesterday's were the first to air nationally during the big game since at least 1989. Each politician dropped a reported $10 million on those ads. Many students have credited teachers with saving their lives or helping them in a time of need, but this educator took it to another level while she says she donated part of her liver to a student. Don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe, join the conversation in the community section. We have more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. Only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. About I mean, that. Reward would be... Slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. A little water yes. in my cup. And and beautiful skin. Well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. It's not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning rush, weekdays, five to seven AM. Only on eleven alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the rush block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the rush block on the morning rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hot spots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went A Forsyth County kindergarten teacher reuniting with a former student after more than a decade to help save her life. This is quite a story. 16-year-old Riley Highland was diagnosed four years ago with liver disease. Her father began sharing Riley's story with his co-workers at North Forsyth Middle School. And that's when he reconnected with one of his daughter's former teachers, Gina Garner. Ms. Garner was preparing to donate part of her liver to a relative when she discovered it would no longer be needed. And at the last minute, she got a phone call because of an organ donor. She got a deceased donor. And here I was expecting to share my liver with her, and that didn't happen. And at the same time, I'm getting to know Chris, making the connection with Riley, and I just felt like it wasn't a coincidence that I ended up at this school. And so that's why I offered. The surgery was set to take place today, and we will be following up with the pair to hear about Riley's father from uh, the reconnection, you can head to my coming news section of our website. After a beautiful dry day with record tying temperatures getting up to 76 degrees this afternoon, 
we now shift our attention to a, another system that's moving our way that's going to bring us rain, and that is even prompting a flood watch. This is not in effect for us tonight or tomorrow. It's really in effect for Wednesday through Friday morning as we're watching the rain that's going to be moving our way. And as of right now, Atlanta is not in this flood watch, but it is for these areas up to the north of us. Once you get into Cherokee County, Forsyth County, Hall County, over toward Floyd County, Bartow County, and then over just to the north of the Athens area, that line northward, all of those North Georgia counties are in this flood watch. We're going to see some heavy rain Wednesday and Thursday, three to five inches of rain possible in these areas that could cause minor to moderate flooding. So we just want to give you advanced notice of this flood potential here. If you live in a flood prone area, I want you to prepare for that. We're also going to be watching for a severe weather threat uh, tomorrow. It's going to be out to the west. It's a marginal risk or level one out of five risk for those areas to the west. Then as that moves over toward the east, looks like the strongest storms will be down in South Alabama and the Florida Panhandle where there's a level two risk, but we are in a marginal risk or level one risk for later in the day on Wednesday with damaging wind gusts possible and heavy rainfall that'll be moving our way. And then as we advance into Thursday, I'm really thinking our main threats for stronger storms will be late Wednesday into the daytime hours on Thursday. And this is showing the main risks for the, what is the equivalent of a level two risk here on Thursday with damaging wind gusts. Isolated tornadoes are not out of the question. And again, watching that heavy rainfall that'll be moving our way. So that's gonna be the main day on Thursday for that stronger storm risk. 68 for a high tomorrow. We'll go with a six on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Now on Tuesday, we're gonna see mostly cloudy skies and some showers mainly in the afternoon just scattered around. Then on Wednesday, the rain chance comes up a little bit more, still just kind of scattered variety, but it's really going to be later on Wednesday. This is at five o'clock, not much going on here, but then you see this area of rain. That's the part that has the heaviest rain weather and thunderstorms. This is at 10 o'clock Wednesday night, the potential for some stronger storms here then overnight into early on Thursday. And then the system kind of stays with us here throughout the day on Thursday before it finally moves out. And that's why we have that potential for those strong storms that'll be moving our way. Also significant rainfall Tuesday, the rainfall amounts low there to the north and west. It starts creeping up though, as we get into Thursday uh, and then early on Friday, you can see those highest amounts up in North Georgia, and that's why right now North Georgia is in that flood watch. So here's the timeline. 68 for a high Thursday, uh, Tuesday actually, 40% chance for showers, 70% chance later Wednesday, 100% chance on Thursday, and that potential for some stronger thunderstorms. We dry out Friday and we cool off. Lows near 37, a high of 51, 56 Saturday with a low rain chance at 20%, and dry Sunday and Monday with high temperatures creeping back up to 62 by Monday. The U.S. now blocking people from traveling into our borders from China to keep the coronavirus from spreading. But just how deadly is it compared to other viruses? We're breaking down the numbers next. Five to seven on the morning rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, away. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, auntie. No. <laughs> auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. 
And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you to do what I say in the No, 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 You can assume it. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? We now have our 11th confirmed case of the coronavirus here in the United States. And meanwhile, the first U.S. patient who became infected after traveling to China has now been released from a Washington State hospital. He says he's looking forward to life returning to normal, however that may be defined. Yeah, this outbreak continues to spread in China where more than 300 people have died now. On Friday, the Secretary of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency in the United States. That means any foreign national who has been to China in the last two weeks cannot enter the United States. The Chinese Foreign Ministry not happy about that ban. They say while other countries have offered support, this decision by the U.S. is not based on facts, nor is it helpful. Here's Cheryl Preheim with more. We thought it would be helpful to put into perspective some of the different strains and how deadly they are. So we turn to our 11 Alive medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy. This strain is new, but coronavirus has been around for quite some time. You're right, coronaviruses, and these are the four common ones that have been around since actually the 1960s. People remember the epidemic with SARS and more recently MERS. Those were discovered in 2002 and 2009, and now obviously we have the Wuhan coronavirus. But these strains have been around for a long time. The coronavirus is not new. Okay, maybe a mutated version of something from the past we don't know at this point, You're right? right, or just a new virus that we've never seen before that, again, it could have been in animals and now it's come to people. Sure. Put into perspective how deadly this is, we're hearing those numbers go up a lot, but we don't really have a full grasp of the spread of this quite yet. You are right. To put into perspective, the seasonal flu kills less than 1% of people. But think about that. There have been 19 million cases. When you think about how many more cases of flu we see, that's the death rate. For this new Wuhan, the novel coronavirus we're talking about, we're guessing it's about 2%. But that number may change. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then for SARS, it killed about 10 percent of people that were affected with it. And MERS killed about 30 percent of people. So obviously SARS and MERS were more lethal when we're talking about the novel coronavirus. So this could change because this is a percentage based on just known cases. Exactly right. And we're thinking there may be more people who had it or have it but have mild symptoms and may not even know, in which case when you take that number and make it larger compared to the people that have sure. died, this will go down. So, you know, again, I don't think people need to panic. The odds of this coming to Atlanta, in my opinion, right now with all the precautions being taken is very slim. Right now, it's a concern for people who've either traveled to China or been exposed to someone who's traveled to okay, China. Okay, you've been so helpful giving us tips in the past. We have put all of that for you on 11live.com. If you need more information, that'll be a great resource for you. Dr. Reddy, thanks. Thank you. All right, guys, coming up in the next half hour, we are looking at claims that Lysol can protect you from coronavirus. And still ahead, how nearly half a million dollars worth of stolen cars wow. ended up behind a Metro Atlanta motel. We're going to look into this one. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. They <laughs> are fun. They're and they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a new yeah. way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together, we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows hey, and they would, you know, they yeah. would wait the next week, you're all, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of After months, in some cases, years of campaigning, the first contest for Democratic presidential hopefuls has now arrived. The Iowa caucuses are happening right now. And historically, they indicate how candidates will do in the longer term. But maybe history is not a judge as far as 2020 goes. Joining me right now, 11 Alive political analyst, Dr. Andre Gillespie from Emory is here. Always a great pleasure and privilege to have you, a, a Yale woman. Thank you. And uh, let's talk about Iowa, an antiquated process. And does it hold the kind of merit it did when Edmund Muskie was running in 1968 against uh, you know, all the other Democrats. Well, I mean, in 72, he was running. Well, that's before, 68 in particular, is before the modern primary season. So Iowa and New Hampshire, you know, are not terribly representative of the rest of the United States, but they do hold a traditional place as being the first in the nation primaries and caucuses. And even as other states have clamored to move closer to the front of the line, um, both Iowa and New Hampshire have set up, you know, structural reasons within their own state law and actually even with the National Democratic Party to make sure that they're first. And, you know, it doesn't seem like, you know, this is the right place for them to start, but the, the benefit of starting in a small state is that for an unknown candidate, somebody who can put together a strong organization and really right. get out and do retail campaigning, this is a place where they can prove their mettle. And this is a place where everyone will declare victory tonight, don't you think? Well, I don't know if everyone is going to declare victory tonight. Um, you I think some people will drop out? Some people have to drop out. I mean, you know, we forget that they that should have dropped out by now. That there are, you know, still tons of candidates in the race, not the ones who always make the debate, but no. a lot of them are going to run out of money. Tonight is the end of the road for them. Candidates who really underperform expectations will also be pressured to probably put an end to their campaigns. I think the big question tonight is to look at those top five candidates, see who underperforms, see whether or not they still have resources to be able to continue their race. And we have this new phenomenon called billionaires who want to be president, Strayer. Bloomberg, I mean, they're not, not going to win. I mean, and, and they're spending just copious amounts of money for what? Well, Bloomberg is not officially kind of, you know, under consideration tonight. So Bloomberg's right. strategy has been to officially enter the race on Super Tuesday. And his idea is that the other candidates will kind of fight themselves down and there won't be a clear front runner by Super Tuesday. What do you think of that strategy? That, that, that just no matter. It is an incredibly risky strategy. Yeah. It is a strategy yeah. that, you know, other candidates have attempted in various forms and failed. Hillary Clinton tried it in various forms. Rudolph Giuliani tried it, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in his own kind of formulation of that. Um, this camp where there's so many candidates, there may actually be an opportunity for that to work. We have to wait and see, but it is incredibly risky. So we have this old school caucus thing working, and then we head to New Hampshire, which, you know, has become more of a tradition. I mean, when I think about New Hampshire, I think about champagne bottles breaking on submarines and FDR and things like that. It's just, it's an old process that 
you know, it doesn't determine ultimately who the nominee is going to be on either party. But what it does do is it helps to set momentum. So candidates who should do well there who falter in these states are going to have a hard time making the case to funders and future supporters that they should continue to volunteer, that they should continue to make phone calls, and in particular that they should continue to donate to those campaigns. Well, I'm, I'm one of those people that I think that Iowa and New Hampshire ought to be tossed out and you just proceed to Super Tuesday. Yeah, I mean, but they will fight that tooth and nail both in the DNC and then also within their own state legislatures. All right, so tell me what I should see tonight and how I should read the tea leaves. Um, so one, um, I expect that uh, anywhere from three to five of the candidates will probably get delegates as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Again, I think it's looking at the over-under to see who is overperforming, who's exceeding expectations, and who is not actually meeting the expectations that were set. So I think the ones who were most in danger of not meeting expectations are actually Joe Biden and Amy Klobuchar at this yeah. point. Um, Klobuchar's campaign could be imperiled as a result of this. Um, Biden doesn't have a whole lot of money to be able to carry him through. Even if somebody like a Pete Buttigieg has a bad night, he still has a lot of money that would actually carry but him through. But he needs to do well. To I mean, that's New his Hampshire. people, right? Oh, he absolutely has to do well. I mean, I think for Klobuchar or Buttigieg, they've made the case that they are the ones that can win the Midwest. And if Midwestern voters don't support them in this race, then that's a harbinger for bad things to come. Are you surprised that Bernie Sanders has remained more than relevant? That He's awfully strong. Did, did you expect him to be this strong at this point in 2020? So, yes and no. I mean, one of the things that we can say from 2016 is despite the fact that Sanders lost that race, he had a huge impact on Democratic Party politics yeah. in terms of how delegates are being allocated in this election, particularly superdelegates. So he's always played an important role. I think the question was with, with Elizabeth Warren in the race. I think people expected that the progressive vote was going to divide more evenly than it appears. We'll see whether or not that's actually true after tonight. And I think most people were surprised that he's been as strong as he is given the health scare that he had this fall when he had his heart attack. To serve uh, and, and really to do well in, in primaries, you have to swerve to the left or very much to the right. You can't be any kind of middle-of-the-road character and, and survive primaries. Well, I mean, part of that's, I mean, that's a sort of a distillation of median voter theory. So the Democratic electorate is going to be, just by virtue of the fact that there aren't oh, Republicans or, or more ideological conservatives in the race, yeah. it is actually more liberal than what a general electorate is going to be. But the question is, do you swerve so far to the left that you can't come back and then reach out to more centrist voters in the general election, voters that Democrats are actually going to need in order to be able to win the general L election? Let me take you one other place that's a little bit off the wall. Rush Limbaugh today announcing mm -hmm. that he has uh, stage four cancer. His impact on the American political process, depending on what your perspective is, or, or maybe even not your perspective, has been so amazing. Not necessarily for the better, but but it has been, it's changed everything. It's changed the left and the right. I mean, he has um, taken talk radio and he and others have made that a medium by which they were able to reach out uh, to conservative voices. It was a- Who felt like they didn't have a voice. Yeah, and it was it was a, a, a mode that liberals tried to uh, recreate. They weren't able to do that in the same way. So, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a question for who his successors are, one, what tone they have and whether or not they continue to use yeah. talk radio as a medium. Yeah, I think AM radio is probably not going to survive without Russell Limbaugh living. That's we'll for see. sure if that happens. Yeah, a lot to talk about. Dr. Gillespie, always interesting, always insightful. Thank you. We'll talk to you a little bit later on these broadcasts. Thank you. Jennifer? Well, there is a push for the public to be able to get information about any Georgia law enforcement officer being investigated for use of force. The idea is to make a database, and supporters say this goes a long way towards transparency and accountability, particularly in police shootings. Now, according to statistics from the GBI, 2018 was the deadliest year on record with 92 police shootings, 48 of them deadly. Last year, the GBI was asked to investigate 84 police shootings, 37 fatal, and they've been called to at least 11 so far in 2020. Most of the controversy in officer-involved shootings usually focuses on whether the use of force was justified, but Chief Investigator Brendan Keith is exploring another question. Why do some officers heroically try to save suspects that they've shot, while others simply wait for an ambulance? Shut the vehicle off, put your hands outside the window, I'm not going to ask you again. Some officers go above and beyond the call. He's dead, dude. Oh, he's still got a try. He does to get it's, more it's, it's one. Including right here in Atlanta, where officers now carry tourniquets to save each other and the suspects they've just shot. Hey, stay with me, stay with me. <laughs> Sometimes it's a life sentence versus a death sentence. You don't belong here. Blake Peacock was shot by a sheriff's deputy in Bleckley County, Georgia. They didn't render any aid. 
Central shot fired. Have EMS rolling. Sheriff's deputies called for an ambulance within seconds, but then stood over Blake Peacock as he gasped for air face down. Like they shot a deer. They don't even turn him over. He fell on his face. They called EMS right away. They called for an ambulance. What should they have done next? Now this is a injured human being. I think they should have tried to use any form of life-saving training that they had uh, to save my son. Brendan, did the father sue the deputies in this case? Cheryl, he did, but not for wrongful death. The officers were cleared in the shooting itself. He sued for deliberate indifference. Did that work? What did the court say? A federal judge actually dismissed the case, saying police officers have no legal duty to provide first aid. All they have to do is call an ambulance. The U.S. Supreme Court issued a similar ruling. I think a lot of people might be surprised to learn that. So do other police departments have different rules? Do they have to give aid if someone's in front of them needing medical help? They do. The Atlanta Police Department requires it, for example. But it really depends on the culture of each department. Only one state requires police officers to provide medical aid by law. That's Washington state huh. after a referendum by voters was passed there. All right. I know you're going to have more tonight at 11. That's right. On Up Late, we're going to look at this issue and we're going to also answer some of your questions questions and comments that right. you're seeing online. And you can always see more of Brendan's investigations Sundays at 6 p.m. on The Reveal. Well, we enjoyed a very dry day today. It was dry on Sunday with this air mass that's sitting over us right now, but things are about to change. We have moisture that is building out to the west. You can see these colors indicating the more moist air that's going to start moving in. And during the day on Tuesday, it's not going to be an all-day rain. We're just going to see a few scattered showers that will develop, especially later in the day on Tuesday. But we're going to have plenty of moisture that will be with us on Wednesday as well as on Thursday that will give us rain and even significant rain in some spots. We have a flat or actually a flood watch in effect for far north Georgia uh, for Wednesday through Friday morning. But once this rain is able to kick out of here, look what happens by the end of the week. It not only is going to dry out with this purple color indicating the very dry air, but it's also going to cool off by the end of the week as well. It's that transition between those air masses where we're going to see the rain shower activity and that potential for storms. We'll break that down for you coming up. There are some stories in local television that you sort of raise your eyebrow about. This is one of them. Three cars worth almost a half a million dollars were found sitting behind a Buford Highway motel. Brookhaven police say they were tipped off to be on the lookout for a stolen Rolls. They found the car behind the motel along with two Maseratis. According to police, look at these beautiful vehicles, mm -hmm. man. All three cars were stolen from a dealership in Texas, and they found their way to Atlanta. Police say after a brief stakeout, three men arrested when they came back for those cars. Police say the vehicles will be returned to the dealership. A mother and her one-year-old baby killed in a house fire. Tonight, investigators are trying to figure out how it all started. Joe Hinkey went to LaGrange and spoke with the fire chief. The small home here along Reeves Street remains taped off as the LaGrange Fire Department continues its investigation. There is little damage to see to the outside of the home, but I'm told in a bedroom inside is where firefighters found the mother and her daughter. A broken window is one of only a few signs you can see from the outside of the fire. You know, the fire was relatively small. LaGrange Fire Chief John Brandt says the fire only destroyed one room inside. Uh, the rest of the house is just um, smoke damage and there was a lot of melting um, that happened throughout the house when the heat increased. So. Brandt says around 740 Sunday morning, an alarm company called 911 after two smoke alarms went off. Firefighters spotted smoke as they drove up, but no flames. They then went in through the front door to put out the fire and found the flames behind a closed bedroom door in the back of the house. They extinguished the fire, uh, did a quick swipe with the uh, thermal imaging camera. Um, at that time, didn't see any victims. With the fire put out, a search and rescue team went in and found the bodies of 29-year-old Tatiana McFarland and one-year-old Minova Satterwhite underneath several blankets in the bedroom where the fire broke out. I believe that uh, they were asleep and um, the door was shut to the, the room, the bedroom, and uh, the smoke didn't make it to the, the smoke alarm before um, it caused the, the damage. Neighbors say the mother and her daughter only moved in a short time ago, and while none of the neighbors knew the pair, Brandt says the fire is a loss for the community and tough on his department. You know, being taken from you know, such an early age and from a fire, it's devastating, it's hard on the crews. 
Um, it's never a, a pretty sight. And um, so we pray for their families and, and uh, you know, also pray for our guys. Hope that um, even though it's a difficult time that, that, you know, through prayer, everybody can get through it. And the LaGrange fire chief said he could not speculate about the cause of the fire as it remains under investigation. But he did say so far investigators have not found anything suspicious. A viral post claiming Lysol can stop the spread of coronavirus outbreak. Is that true? We'll verify it coming up next. Experience. Good guys do finish last. Mm. Oh, I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've like got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, Good guys didn't oh, finish. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, uh, yeah. Right, right. About that. Well, reward would be slimming, slimming down. Okay, yes. yeah, right? yeah, okay. yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hot spots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crock Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains World health officials continue to fight the coronavirus in China, the first of two new hospitals is now taking in patients. It was built in less than 10 days, and the Chinese government says it's needed to combat the outbreak. So far, coronavirus has infected tens of thousands of people and killed at least 360 across China since early December. A viewer called 11 Alive uh, connecting coronavirus to Lysol spray, and it's creating quite the conversation online. 11 Alive is, of course, where Atlanta speaks, so we wanted to set out and verify the post is making around on Facebook and a user points out that the Lysol can mentions the coronavirus and claims it's proof that the government knew about the virus before this outbreak started. So is that true? Did Lysol know about the virus before this outbreak happened? Well, according to researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, the answer is no. They want to remind people that the word coronavirus is not specific and that it encompasses numerous strands of the virus. Strands that existed before this recent outbreak are included in all of that. And that's why you may see the word on products like Lysol and Clorox. So while the Lysol can may contain the word coronavirus, it does not refer to this new strain that originated in Wuhan, China. 
So can Lysol help increase your chances of staying healthy against the new strain of the virus? Well, we reached out to our medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy. She says when use is directed, Lysol is able to kill viruses and bacteria. Hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol is also effective. However, the most effective way to fight those germs, as always, washing your hands with soap and warm water. Well, we're going to be watching those storms out to the west that will start getting their act together and moving toward us during the day on Tuesday. We're just going to see a few scattered showers that will develop here. We're not worried about severe weather here on Tuesday. That severe weather threat is going to be on the low end, the level one out of five risk that goes through parts of Tennessee, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, and even back into eastern parts of Texas. But as the system moves over toward the east, you can see that the strongest of the storms shift down toward the south in the Gulf Coast region where there's a level two of five risk area in South Alabama and in the Florida Panhandle. But we see the marginal risk or level one of five risk getting closer to us in Atlanta late on Wednesday. It's going to be late Wednesday overnight into Thursday when we're going to see our storm risk actually uh, be the highest and we'll see what is the equivalent of a level two risk area on Thursday for close to the Atlanta area over to the east of us. And it's not only going to be for strong winds possible, but also the potential for some isolated tornadoes develop and also that heavy rainfall. So here's a look at what we're watching. We're in a spring like pattern. You know, we tied the record today. We got up to 76 degrees for a high and we're going to stay mild the next few days. Not as warm as we were today. We'll be generally there in the 60s to around 70 degrees. Then the rain is going to be moving in. It starts off as scattered showers on Tuesday, a better chance for rain Wednesday, and then that storm risk late Wednesday and then throughout the day on your Thursday. So here's what we're watching on Tuesday. A six on the wasometer. This is our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Mild in the morning at 52. We get up to 68 in the afternoon. Mix of sun and clouds early on and then more clouds later in the Day with that better rain chance later in the day as well. You can see that here, just scattered stuff. Then on Wednesday, still a few scattered showers at any time throughout the day. This is at noontime in the afternoon, maybe some breaks, but there's that main area of rain and that heavier rain and that thunderstorm risk that comes in Wednesday night. This is at 10 o'clock. You can see some of those heavier showers with thunder and lightning, maybe some strong winds with that early in the morning on Thursday. And then this pretty much hangs out with us throughout the day here as the frontal boundary stalls out on us and we'll continue to see those bands of heavy rain that'll move our way and with that we'll have that potential for thunderstorms moving in as well. So here's a look at the rain totals. We do have a flood watch in effect for far north Georgia for Wednesday through Friday morning. Here is why you see the lighter amounts during the day here on Tuesday. Wednesday amounts up in North Georgia between a half inch and an inch and a half, but then that goes up to maybe between two and some pockets of four inches of rain in far North Georgia, where we could see uh, some flooding in those areas. And that's why they have a flash, actually a flood watch in effect. 70% chance for rain Wednesday, 100% chance on Thursday, watching for that storm threat as well. We are cooling down though Friday as we dry out for the end of the week. Saturday looks mainly dry, just a low rain chance at 20%, and then dry Sunday and Monday with high temperatures upper 50s to lower 60s. The impeachment trial is drawing to a close what each side had to say during closing arguments. Weekday 5 to 7 a.m. only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyperlocal, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make, call me, but I stay in the flow. So you just do what I say. No, 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 Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A-Scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, I sent my drafts. That's my bad. So 
so you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Stop. I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, yeah, I've got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Uh, yeah. Right, right. I mean, that. One reward would be... Slimming. Slimming down. Okay. Yes. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And and beautiful skin. <laughs> well, you know, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. I'm not gonna be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning rush, weekdays, five to seven AM. Only on eleven alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the rush block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. The impeachment trial is now drawing to a close. Today, House managers and President Trump's defense team presented closing arguments, given that the majority of senators are Republicans. Many are expecting this to end in the president's acquittal. NBC Susan McGinnis in Washington looking at what happens next. After months of hearings, arguments, and testimony, President Trump's fate heading into the hands of senators. And I ask that this partisan impeachment come to an end. Donald Trump has betrayed his oath to protect and defend the Constitution. But it is not too late for us to honor ours. Today's closing arguments allowing both sides their final attempt to sway the coming vote on impeachment. This is an issue of conscience to everybody. A few GOP senators concede Democrats did prove their case, but arguing his actions don't warrant removal by Congress. The only appropriate result here is to acquit the president and to leave it to the voters to choose their president. On Twitter today, the president calling the impeachment a hoax, pointing to Ukraine's president affirming he felt no pressure. Following today's closes, senators who have acted as jurors in this trial will make speeches, which could last right up until voting time Wednesday afternoon. A good deed lands one local student on Sports Center on ESPN, the shot that has everybody talking. That's coming up next. A lot of game with this kid. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Fun. Yeah. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. So what's the best part about Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together, we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. 
Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they yeah. didn't wait the next week. Ah. You were, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Live's Chesley McNeil. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. A simple gesture can certainly go a long way. One local basketball coach found that out firsthand. His good deed landed one of his players on SportsCenter on ESPN. Here goes. So, we're going to reward you singing that. you dressing out with a singing night. Senior night at Pace Academy to celebrate. Coach Sherman White announced team manager Daniel Lucky will suit up. He is, as the name implies, lucky indeed. His teammates went wild. And Daniel has worked for the team for two years, but nobody knew he had this kind of game. All right, check this out. With around four seconds left in the game, Daniel dribbles down the floor, crossed over an opponent, and drains a three from the logo. Crowd went wild there. The entire student section rushed to congratulate the senior on certainly a special night, one he's never going to forget. When the video was posted, it instantly went viral. It's been viewed more than four million times. If I'm the headmaster at Pace, I call in the basketball coach, <laughs> and I say, so you didn't know this what? guy had that kind of game? <laughs> what were you doing? What were you doing? From were you not logo? paying attention? Man. Yeah, either he took really good notes for two years as team manager yeah. or he knew how to seize the moment. Absolutely. So this kid just wants to hear da 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 Yeah. He will for the rest of his life. <laughs> yeah, there you go. All right, good to see you guys. Thank you. All right, it's almost 9 o'clock. Of course, we have a lot coming up on 11 Alive News primetime. First of all, tonight, we are following the money. We're digging into what kind of access money can buy you when it comes to Georgia's congressional races. And results are coming in from the Iowa caucus. We're looking at how this one is different and why it can have a wide impact all across the country. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. First tonight, new numbers, new restrictions, and new fears about the coronavirus. The CDC is calling this an unprecedented threat. There have been 17,000 cases reported of the coronavirus in China with 360 deaths. And here in the U.S. of A, 11 known cases, two of those people were infected by household members who had been to China. And very strict travel restrictions are now in effect. Any American citizen or family member that has been to China over the past 14 days will be redirected to one of 11 hospitals for a full CDC screening. And tonight, folks, uh, there's fears economic fallout from the spread of the coronavirus. Major U.S. companies are now seeing the effects of the virus, such as Starbucks and Apple. Atlanta area financial experts believe if the spread of the virus doesn't slow down, everyday people will start to feel it too. Mm -hmm. Chenu Har explains what this could really look like. Well, Ron Aisha, financial experts at the East Paces Group in Atlanta say right now, Impacts aren't big enough where the average person is going to feel it, but they say it can only stay that way if the number of infections plateau where it is today. The coronavirus has financial experts on alert, keeping their eyes on the stock market and investments. There certainly will be effects both nationally and just here in our home city if, um, if this virus isn't contained. Alex Reffitt is the co-founder of the East Paces Group, an independent investment advisory firm in Atlanta. He says if there are more infections of the coronavirus, the global economy and American companies will take a hit. Workers in China that are not working and you've got a huge manufacturing hub that's going to be affected. Um, and, and production levels are obviously potentially going to go down because of it. He says with how connected the world's economy is now, lack of production can create a negative sentiment about the Chinese market, which can hurt companies in America with Chinese ties. And if the coronavirus does not slow down, the effects can trickle down to Atlanta. We've got the CDC, you've got the busiest airport in the world. I mean, that obviously being in Atlanta, 
our team thinks about this a lot more. Travel and tourism are big industries here. Some major airlines have already canceled flights to and from China. Your personal finances can also be at risk. Your 401ks, your IRAs, your investments, um, you know, with when rates change, your fixed income investments uh, are affected. But will it get there? Refit says if things stay the way they are, then no. SARS is the last case he remembers like this, and he's confident this may play out the same way. All right, now Refit says right now you'll more likely to see the effects of the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the major industrial stocks, especially those that have some sort of relationship with China. All right, thanks, Chanu. So this year's election is expected to be the most expensive in history. Campaign finance records show Georgia's U.S. senators, who are both facing an election this November, each have a substantial lead right now over their rivals. Kelly Leffler helped kick off her campaign with a $5 million personal loan, and David Perdue finished 2019 with nearly $8 million in the bank. His closest Democratic challenger, John Ossoff, ended the year with about a million and a half. All of that money pouring in raises questions about political donors' motivations. It also spotlights Senator Perdue, who skipped a Senate committee meeting. The reason? For missing the meeting, he was attending a donor event instead. 11 Alive's Doug Richards walks us through what happened and how. Senator David Perdue has raised more than $9 million for his 2020 re-election campaign. To get serious. yearly donations from high-dollar supporters, Perdue formed what he calls the boardroom as disclosed by the Center for Public Integrity. A chairman-level donor can get, for $5,400 annually, quarterly events with the senator, a retreat at Georgia's Sea Island Resort, and a reception at Purdue's personal residence at Sea Island. And it's not just Purdue, says UGA's Charles Bullock. But it's pretty standard. Dr. Bullock says big bucks donors get more than a friendly voice in Congress. You're buying access so that you know you can have face time with the legislator or when you call the office the receptionist puts you through to the legislator that's what you're paying for if you're a big dollar donor purdue will be part of a 2020 election projected to be history's most expensive in 2008 congressional races across america cost two and a half trillion dollars by 2018 that amount more than doubled Last year, Purdue had a boardroom meeting scheduled with his biggest donors near the U.S. Capitol February 13th on what turned out to be a busy workday for senators. For an hour, Purdue presided over the Senate on a day when the Senate debated William Barr's nomination for attorney general. After all the bills are paid, it goes into a... No, I said the reserve fund. That afternoon, a Senate Armed Services subcommittee held a sometimes contentious hearing on the thorny issue of substandard military housing at Georgia's Fort Benning and other facilities nationwide. Purdue is a member of the subcommittee. Purdue missed the three-hour meeting, according to a transcript. During the first hour of the meeting, from 2 to 3 p.m., Purdue was in the presiding officer's chair in the Senate. From 3 to 4 p.m., Purdue's staff says he had unspecified meetings with Georgia constituents. The boardroom meeting with campaign donors started at 4 p.m., and Purdue joined them, while the Senate subcommittee hearing continued in his absence a few blocks away. Scheduling a member of Congress can be a juggling act. You know, you've got a whole bunch of things, and you can't handle all of them. Yeah, Dr. Bullock says Purdue probably should have prioritized the military hearing rather than the event with donors. Missing a committee meeting or subcommittee meeting that directly impacts your constituency for a fundraiser, probably not a smart idea. Political operatives will tell you campaign fundraising is exhausting and distracting. Retired Major General Arnold Panaro worked for Democratic Senator Sam Nunn. I've been impressed with Senator Perdue and his commitment uh, to the military families. I don't think what counts is what how many hearings you go to, what counts is, what are the results that you get? Senator Purdue's office released a statement saying the senator has, quote, taken strong action to improve military housing at bases in Georgia. It did not address his scheduling that day nearly a year ago. We tried for days but never got to chat with a senator who was busy 
with impeachment last week. Well, Georgia's other senator, Kelly Leffler, is also fighting to keep her seat in 2020. Appointed by uh, Governor Brian Kemp to replace Senator Johnny Isaacson, Leffler has only been in Washington, D.C. for about a month. And as NBC's Meet the Press moderator, Chuck Todd points out, that means her arrival on Capitol Hill has been overshadowed by yeah. President Trump's impeachment trial. I do think she really hasn't been here long enough to make much of an impression, and the one impression she made is of a candidate looking like trying really hard to um, appease the Trump base. By, by the way, folks, you're going to uh, find more on both Senate races on 11alive.com slash politics, and we're taking a closer look at tonight's caucus in Iowa and what it means for the presidential election. That's coming up in less than 10 minutes. Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers with you live right now on the ATL during our 9 p.m. newscast as well as talking to our storm trackers and folks on my 11 Alive Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive, and we're talking about the weather. Um, Carol Abbott says we had a spectacular sunset in Silver Creek tonight. Um, Judy Clanton says a beautiful day today would be nice if it would stay this way. That's good. Um, a lot of folks saying good evening and then... Uh, Shaquilla Skytrain says, opening my pool, third week of March. Good for you there. Well, it felt a lot like pool weather today. You know, we tied a record today up to 76 degrees. Very warm, feeling a lot like spring. But take a look at radar. No rain right now, but we've been watching a few of those clouds that have been moving in. Take a look now at the bigger picture. Let me show you what we're watching out there at this hour. We have that rain that is out to the west, and it doesn't look that impressive right now, but this is the system that eventually is going to be coming into our area, increasing our rain chances tomorrow a little bit, and then we'll have even higher rain chances for Wednesday and Thursday, and even the potential for some storms that will be moving in. So in advance of all this rain moving in, the National Weather Service has issued a flood watch in effect for North Georgia. This isn't for tonight or for tomorrow. This really goes into effect Wednesday, and it will expire early on Friday morning. And it's for these areas from Rome there in Floyd County, Bartow County, Cherokee County, uh, Forsyth County, Hall County, Banks, Jackson County, that line up to the north. These counties are under that flood watch. Heavy rain possible Wednesday and Thursday, maybe three to five inches of rain, and that could cause some minor to moderate flooding in those areas. And we'll let you know if that gets extended more to the south and includes Metro Atlanta. We're not only dealing with a flood threat, but also the risk for some severe storms. Stay with us. We're going to tell you who are who are in those risk areas and also uh, it, the timing of this system and when it's going to move out. More on that in just a few minutes. All right, thanks, Chris. Topping tonight's speed fee. Closing arguments are underway in the impeachment trial of President Donald Trump. So today was the final chance for the House managers and White House lawyers to make their case for acquittal or conviction before Wednesday's final vote. With Republicans uniting Friday to block witnesses, the outcome is all but certain. Four Georgia communities claim Airbnb owes them some money. The Atlanta Business Chronicle reports Cartersville, Rome, Tybee Island, and Hart County are suing the short-term rental company for failing to collect and remit taxes owed to those municipalities. They're also asking the federal court to certify this as a class action lawsuit. A big relocation effort is underway at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. 50 trees are being carefully removed from the North Druid Hills campus and transplanted to new homes around the city of Brookhaven as the hospital clears space for its upcoming development project. All right, can the state do more to keep this from happening again? It's a question many of you are asking after seeing this horrific video and pictures of that deadly tanker crash shut down a section of Interstate 85 in North Cross for almost 10 hours on Saturday. A truck transporting 8,500 pounds of fuel slammed into a car, stopped from a previous accident, erupting into flames, killing both drivers. And as 11 Alive's Elwin Lopez shows us, this tragic accident comes as GDOT and Gwinnett County are taking a hard look at safety along Interstate 85's corridor. Public meetings already taking place this week with the first one in Norcross tomorrow. GDOT says it is asking the community for solutions to ease congestion and improve safety. This all comes following a tragic crash on I-85 and a massive backup that came after. Many questioning whether truck traffic should be separate from commuters in and around Atlanta. This comprehensive corridor study area is roughly 18 miles long on I-85 between I-285 and I-985, mostly in Gwinnett County, with a small portion in DeKalb County. The goal of this study is to improve traffic operations, but in a way that the public and stakeholders want. 
in studies like this, everything is on the table. We don't take anything off the table. We look at everything as we move through the study. And part of that study very well may be a truck only lane like we're going to see south of the city. In just two years, we'll see construction for the first non tolled truck only lanes here in Georgia. And that will be between McDonough and Macon. It is expected to be open to the public in 2028. Now, whether we could see something like that on I-85 is yet to be determined. All right, folks, you can find more photographs, videos, and more on this weekend's deadly Interstate 85 crash and fire on 11alive.com. In Texas at 404-873-9114 for a look at the complete coverage. You can also check 11alive's website for real-time updates on traffic around the metro. They take place in gyms, churches, and even homes. The Iowa caucuses are happening right now and historically indicate how candidates will do in the long term. We'll explain how they work next. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is live on Facebook as we speak, taking all your weather questions. You can see him there. You can join that conversation right now on his Facebook page. We're going to catch up with him right after the break. And don't forget, we are also streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel, keeping you covered everywhere your phone is located. Subscribe and join the conversation. In the community section, we've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Lil Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crown Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel as good vibe. We vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even the Tonight is the first test for Democratic presidential hopefuls, the Iowa caucus. But the process there is a bit different from Georgia, so it doesn't have a voting booth mm. and can even happen inside someone's home. Jennifer Bellamy has a look at how the caucus works. Well, you guys, it is certainly a big day in Iowa, and as decisions that are made tonight, well, they could really lead to some of the 11 remaining Democratic candidates to drop out of the race. Now, caucuses work differently depending on your political party, and most people will be focused on the Democratic race tonight. But as you said, it's not just a simple vote on a ballot that determines the process. Churches, schools, libraries, and living rooms. No voting booths, and you have to be on time or you can't participate. That's just the beginning of the Iowa caucus. The Democratic caucus is based on discussions. After hearing from the candidates, supporters split up into different groups and work to move anyone who's undecided to their team. Then there's a count, with organizers looking to candidates who gather at least 15 percent of support in that particular location. Those groups are considered viable and can remain, but those who don't reach that mark must decide to join others, try and increase their numbers, declare themselves undecided, or go home. It's called a realignment. The numbers are then recounted, delegates are assigned, and results are reported. Republicans, on the other hand, use secret ballot to declare their choice. Ballots are counted and participants head home. Delegates are then filtered to national convention delegates. And since President Trump has little opposition for the Republican nomination, that caucus isn't as important to follow. As for the Democrats, the winner will be the candidate who gets the most state delegate equivalents after that realignment process. Tonight, Democrats in Iowa expect to top their 2008 record turnout when they say nearly 240,000 people took part. And while she won't be caucusing herself, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms 
is in Iowa as well. She posted these pictures on Twitter supporting her pick for the White House. That's former Vice President Joe Biden. Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Doesn't that look great? This is a, um, a sunset picture taken by one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers, Michael Druckman, in the Gainesville area. Nice colors there in the sky tonight. Michael was just on here, our Facebook Live. I'm doing a Facebook Live at the same time that I'm doing this newscast. So if you want to log on there real quick, it's the Chris Holcomb 11 Alive Facebook page. And we'll continue our conversation about this. A lot of folks asking about the rain coming in, the severe weather threat, uh, whether or not we'll have flooding. Christy Chandler just says, I just washed my car. Um, let's see here. Uh, Deborah Karn says, hey, Chris, nice here in Lithia Springs. Thanks for the update. You are welcome. So uh, anyway, we are uh, chatting about this. Let me show you guys a few other pictures that we got in from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. Take a look now uh, on, on the big wall and you can see what we're talking. Look at this from Lisa Kramer and Johns Creek. It was just as the sun was going down and then illuminating those clouds that are up above gave us a really nice fiery sunset. Now the one that you saw from Michael just a few minutes ago had uh, even some pink color in there and purple colors. So we're seeing a lot of different ones. And then Blake Robb and Carrollton launched his drone to get this perspective of the sun going down uh, and still some nice color there as well. Now, even though we've had some of those clouds increasing in our area, they're not producing any rain. The rain is still out to the west. And this is the system though. It doesn't look that impressive right now, but this is going to become impressive as it gets closer to us and spreads not only rain into our area, but also a storm risk. So let me break down the rain threat first. There's a flood watch in effect for Wednesday through Friday. This is not in effect now, not in effect tomorrow. It goes into effect Wednesday and it's going to be through Friday morning for areas of North Georgia. Atlanta is not in this. We'll wait and see if they include Atlanta in it later. But for now, it's pretty much from Rome uh, over into Bartow County, Cherokee County, Forsyth County, Hall County, Jackson and Banks County, that line up to the north. Those areas in North Georgia could see three to five inches of rain possible Wednesday and Thursday, and that could cause minor or moderate flooding in those areas. And there's also going to be a severe weather threat. Not tomorrow for us. We're going to be fine here. Low severe weather threat out to the west. And then going into Wednesday, the severe weather threat is going to move down into along the Florida panhandle for the level two risk. The level one risk gets close to Atlanta on Wednesday. So our main threat is going to be late on Wednesday overnight into Thursday. And you can see the Thursday risk is from Atlanta over to the east of us. And it, this would be the equivalent of a level two storm risk where we might see some damaging winds, maybe even some isolated tornadoes again, late Wednesday night into Thursday. So tomorrow is going to be okay. Clouds increase a few scattered showers. We'll give it a six on the wasometer with a high temperature of 68. Here's the timing of what we're watching. Not a lot of rain out there on Tuesday, mostly cloudy skies, a few scattered showers develop late. And then on Wednesday, scattered showers early, but not a lot in the afternoon. And then it's going to be late Wednesday when this main system comes in and you can see the uh, areas of moderate to heavy rain, thunder and lightning with that. That's overnight. Wednesday into early Thursday. This is in the morning Thursday. And then these showers and storms kind of hang out with us during the day until they finally push off to the east late in the afternoon on Thursday. And those are going to be the storms. We'll have that potential for uh, some strong weather with it. So here's the breakdown of what we're watching here. We have that storm threat as we go into Wednesday late into Thursday early. And then by Friday, we dry out partly cloudy skies and it cools off back to 51 degrees. Saturday, the rain chance is really low at only 20%. And then Sunday and Monday dry again. Temperatures 59 Sunday and then up to 62 by Monday. The U.S. is blocking people from traveling to the U.S. from China to keep the coronavirus from spreading. But just how deadly is it compared to other viruses? We're comparing the numbers next. In your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today. Ooh. Did I not text you? All right. Ah, I sent my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Stop. I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've nice got guy. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, 
Good guys didn't oh, finish. Oh, oh. Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, okay. yeah. right, right. about I mean, that. Reward would be... Slimming, Slimming down. Okay. Yes. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, a little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you know, well, even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. It's not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. All right, welcome back, everyone. We now have our 11th confirmed case of the coronavirus right here in the U.S. of A. Meanwhile, the first U.S. patient who became infected after traveling to China has now been released from a Washington State hospital. And he says he's looking forward to returning to a normal life. The outbreak continues to spread in China, where more than 300 people have died. On Friday, the Secretary of Health and Human Services declared a public health emergency in the United States. That means any foreign national who has been to China in the last two weeks cannot enter the United States. The Chinese Foreign Ministry is not happy about that ban. They say while other countries have offered support, this decision by the U.S. is not based on facts, nor is it helpful. Here's Cheryl Preheim with more. We thought it would be helpful to put into perspective some of the different strains and how deadly they are. So we turn to our 11 Alive medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy. This strain is new, but coronavirus has been around for quite some time. You're right, coronaviruses, and these are the four common ones that have been around since actually the 1960s. People remember the epidemic with SARS and more recently MERS. Those were discovered in 2002 and 2009, and now obviously we have the Wuhan coronavirus. But these strains have been around for a long time. The coronavirus is not new. Okay, maybe a mutated version of something from the past. We don't know at this point, You're right? right, or just a new virus that we've never seen before that, again, it could have been in animals and now it's come to people. Sure. Put into perspective how deadly this is, we're hearing those numbers go up a lot, but we don't really have a full grasp of the spread of this quite yet. You are right. To put into perspective, the seasonal flu kills less than 1% of people. But think about that. There have been 19 million cases. So when you think about how many more cases of flu we see, that's the death rate. For this new Wuhan, the novel coronavirus we're talking about, we're guessing it's about 2%. But that number may change. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then for SARS, it killed about 10 percent of people that were affected with it. And MERS killed about 30 percent of people. So obviously SARS and MERS were more lethal when we're talking about the novel coronavirus. So this could change because this is a percentage based on just known cases. Exactly right. And we're thinking there may be more people who had it or have it but have mild symptoms and may not even know, in which case when you take that number and make it larger compared to the people that have sure. died, this will go down. So, you know, again, I don't think people need to panic. The odds of this coming to Atlanta, in my opinion, right now with all the precautions being taken is very slim. Right now, it's a concern for people who've either traveled to China or been exposed to someone who's traveled to okay, China. Okay, you've been so helpful giving us tips in the past. We have put all of that for you on 11alive.com. If you need more information, that'll be a great resource for you. Dr. Reddy, thanks. Thank you. Coming up, a Georgia woman's DNA solves a decades-old cold case that spanned three states. Nobody ever wants to think about being related to the killer. A reveal investigation coming up on Prime Time on the WATL. 
Well, they would wait the next week. You're, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Live's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. newscast not enough for you get even more at 11 alive's youtube channel where you'll find uncut interviews extended body cam footage live streams of atlanta's biggest trials and more subscribe to 11 alive today babe where are my keys uh, where's my lunch where's my phone hey where's my blue shirt where's my pen have you seen it Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go to waste. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Auntie. No. Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to. You know, things are not in your favor. Well, you can't, n nothing is yeah. ever. After months, and in some cases, years of campaigning, the first contest for Democratic presidential hopefuls now is here. The Iowa caucuses are happening tonight and historically indicate how candidates will fare in the future. Joining me right now, 11 Alive political analyst, Dr. Andre Gillespie from Emory, it's always great joy to have you here with us. Tell me how we should interpret information that we get tonight from Des Moines. Well, tonight we're going to get different information than we've gotten in the past. So usually we just hear the final outcome and we get a sense of how the delegates are going to be allocated. But we're actually also going to get raw vote totals. So one of the things we're going to know tonight is uh, how many votes each candidate got sort of in the aggregate um, on the first ballot. If in each uh, precinct a candidate doesn't get 15% of the vote, then those can, um, voters have to go to other candidates um, or they have to band together so that they can be officially uncommitted so that they could have some say at the state party convention. And so we're going to get some raw votes uh, that will relate indirectly um, in some way to what the final sort of allocation of delegates is going to be. So we're going to get a lot more information, three pieces of information, as opposed to the traditional kind of sort of overall delegate allocation percentages. How important is Iowa to the process? How important is it to the three leading candidates tonight? Um, well, it's important to the four leading candidates. So the four that uh, you know, I would be identifying are Buttigieg, Biden, Sanders, and Warren. So the two moderate candidates and the two um, progressive candidates. And I would also throw Amy Klobuchar into it. It's really important for momentum. If somebody doesn't perform according to expectations, it's very likely that their funding support is going to dry up and they'll actually probably lose momentum, maybe lose some volunteer support. If somebody meets expectations or even exceeds expectations, that's likely 
likely going to buoy their candidacies as they go into the next contest, which next week will be in, in New Hampshire, but then even on to the more diverse uh, primaries, which will be in uh, Nevada and in South Carolina toward the end of the month. Is Iowa antiquated and is New Hampshire antiquated? Are, are both of these initial stops on the presidential journey like uh, kind of tooling around in a 73 Monte Carlo that, you know, it's it's all for show and it's certainly not something you can drive every day. Um, so I wouldn't say a 73. How do you like that analogy? That's a bad one. <laughs> They're not a 73 Monte Carlo, but think about well, a classic car from the 1950s that, okay. a cla that attracts a lot of attention. So yes, they are antiquated. Yes, we do understand that Iowa and New Hampshire are not representative of the entire con country. However, uh, there have been various fights within the Democratic Party to try to move them from sort of first in the nation status. They don't work. Uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, you know, make a strong case to the Democratic Committee. They've basically been grandfathered in, and so they do have the status because of the historic importance um, of, of these primaries and helping to select uh, the, the Democratic nominee and the Republican nominee for, for president. So they're likely going to stay where they are. There's also a certain value in unknown candidates being able to prove that they're viable by doing well in small states that require sort of strong organization, that require get out the vote efforts, that require retail um, politicking. If we didn't have the small state model, then you would have what Mike Bloomberg is trying out, which is just some rich guy coming in and throwing a whole bunch of money down and kind of being able to set, set a particular tone. We don't know if that strategy is going to work for Bloomberg, but this allows regular candidates, if you will, people who don't, you know, have unlimited amounts of money at their disposal to really kind of make a case and build an organization that could propel them towards the nomination. Michael Bloomberg interests me as uh, probably less so the other billionaire in the race, Strayer, in, in Tom Strayer. Uh, you know, uh, this strategy is a curious one when you're spending your own money. And if you're going to use populism as some sort of wind behind your back, uh, there has to be more for him than we are seeing right now, yes? Well, we have to wait to see how viable he is. Uh, this week is going to be the first time that he's going to be on a debate stage. Uh, so we really have to see how well he does in, in the primaries, particularly in Super Tuesday, where he's qualifying to, to get on the ballot. Um, you know, it's a risky strategy. It's an unproved strategy. Um, but 2016 was an unconventional race right. with Donald right. Trump. Um, just the number of candidates in this field kind of created opportunities for other candidates to come into the field late to try to upend the results. Uh, even tonight, whoever wins probably isn't going to win with a majority of the vote. They'll win with yeah. a plurality of the vote. So we're looking at something in the 20 to 30 percentage point range. So that means that this race is still pretty wide open. I was trying to think about famous moments in Iowa caucus history, and it would have to be Howard Dean jumps immediately out. Does everybody remember the Howard Dean speech? And now, and then we're on to New Hampshire, and then we're on to... And that was sort of the end of his campaign. Right. So, I mean, so that sort of set this tone that perhaps um, Howard Dean was unhinged and perhaps not ready yet for the Democratic nomination, but that was also the night where John Kerry, who really wasn't yeah. being thought of as a viable candidate, proved his mettle and thus was able to move on towards the nomination. John Kerry, interested in jumping back in. If... Uh, well, he says that that was actually not true and that was just a that was just a rumor. All right. We have seconds left. Anything else? We have about 15 seconds. Anything else you want people to look for tonight, do you think? Um, one, I think we do want to see how Amy Klobuchar does uh, tonight. Um, you know, she was gaining some momentum. She got lots of endorsements. Is that actually going to translate into significant support to allow her to carry on? And then I want to see who quits tomorrow. Um, so a lot of those other candidates in the race, there are 11 folks on the ballot, including some we're not talking about. So we want to see whether or not uh, tonight is the end of the road for them. Dr. Andrew Gillespie, thank you very much. We'll see you uh, coming up at 10 o'clock. I think you are with us again. We appreciate your observations. Makes a lot more sense after we talk to you as opposed to what we've been reading all day. Thanks. Yeah. That 11 includes Michael Bloomberg, who's not actually really running tonight, but maybe Maybe he'll have some people show up. Got it. Guys, back to you. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers, and it's dry out there right now, but we have some clouds that are building, and we're watching this system out to the west that has rain with it. It's not impressive right now. It's really just a broken area of rain uh, from Texas through parts of northern Louisiana, Arkansas, southern Missouri, moving into Mississippi, western parts of Tennessee, western Kentucky, and that moves on up toward uh, Illinois and Indiana as well. This is going to become impressive, though, over the next couple of days as we see it getting get its act together and move on over toward the east, giving us not only a rain chance, 
maybe some heavy rain and maybe even the potential for some storms around. Take a look at what we're watching out there. It was very warm today. Did y'all notice that? Yeah, it was kind of on the warm side. In fact, we tied a record. The uh, high temperature today, 76 degrees. The record for today's date is 76. So we tied that record. The average high for this time of year, 54 degrees. So we were some 22 degrees above the average out there for today. Now the mild air is going to stick around the next couple of days. It's not going to be record breaking, but it is going to be warm, but it's also going to be a little wetter with that moisture from the west moving into our area. We're going to talk more about that coming up in just a few minutes. A former officer who pleaded guilty to attacking a man during a traffic stop could be called to testify against another ex officer as he stands trial this week. The story tops our speed feed tonight. Cell phone video appears to show Gwinnett County officer Robert McDonald on Demetrius Hollins's head during a traffic stop in 2017. Officer Michael Bion Giovanni is also seen punching Hollins in the face while his hands are up. Both officers were fired after the video surfaced and charged with assaulting Hollins. Bon Giovanni took a plea deal and was sentenced to work release and home confinement on one condition. He now is supposed to testify against McDonald in the trial, which started today with jury selection. More than a thousand Delta employees want to join a lawsuit against the company that makes the airline's uniforms. That's according to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle. So right now, there are three lawsuits against Land's End for their passport plum uniforms. Employees say the clothes make them sick and give them rashes. Delta says it is changing its uniforms in 2021. In the meantime, employees can opt to wear other uniform options. And right now, police are searching for the man who punched a 76 year old inside a Gwinnett County Kroger. Check out the surveillance video here. You can see two men walking to the, the Kroger right here. Decula, this is in Decula. That's when one of the men punches the other in the back of the head. The victim, a 76 year old man, fortunately, he's okay. Police say the altercation came moments after the victim asked the suspect to move his car from a fire lane. If you recognize this guy who threw the punch, call police. Welcome to The Reveal on Primetime. I'm investigator Faith Abube. A Georgia woman uploaded her DNA test results to a public website and recently found out investigators used it to track down a murder suspect in her family. We've learned law enforcement agencies are using this new DNA tool more and more, even here in Georgia. But ethics and privacy advocates say it's time state lawmakers step up to protect you and the investigators using your DNA to solve crime. 99.7% um, European. This was more the kind of information Jesse Still was looking for two years ago when she bought a DNA test kit. Like, I think everybody's interested in where you come from, what, you know, your ancestors were. When her results came back, there were a few surprises, like her connection to Africa. And then got that trace evidence of... Congolese? Uh, yeah, Congolese and Angolan. Right around that time, we found the needle in the haystack. Investigators arrested a suspected serial rapist and murderer who terrorized California in the 1970s and 1980s. They did it using something called Forensic Genetic Genealogy, or FGG, to track down Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer, 42 years later. FGG uses someone's DNA profile, just like the one Jesse got from 23andMe, to flesh out a relative who might be connected to a crime. I looked into how to do that and uploaded my DNA to GEDmatch and didn't really think anything would come of it, so I just uploaded it on there and kind of forgot about it. But two months later, a cold case investigator 1,400 miles away sent Jesse this message. She was a familial match to a suspected killer. At first I thought maybe it was a joke or a prank. Nobody ever wants to think about being related to the killer. But Jesse kept thinking about the victim, Helene Przinski, a 21-year-old found in Colorado in 1980, raped and stabbed to death. For nearly 40 years, few leads and little evidence kept the case cold. It's believed that Ms. Pusinski got off her bus after work. But within months of getting Jesse's profile on Judmatch, a big break in the case. Here we are today where we have an individual who is in custody. Detectives used Jesse's DNA to track down and arrest her distant cousin, James Clanton. There's DNA that's part of this case, a big part of this case. For the 1980 rape and murder of Helene. 
Do you know him? Mm -mm. Nope, my dad doesn't know him. It, it's really just made me realize like everything is connected. It's that connection that law enforcement agencies across the country and here in Georgia are hoping to use to solve even more cold cases. It's really very fascinating. Teresa Schieffer and her team at the Cobb County District Attorney's Office used it to solve a serial rape case in January. Fulton County used the same genetic tool to solve a cold case murder last year. And now the GBI, Atlanta police and several other local agencies are exploring the idea of using DNA profiles posted on public websites to track down criminal relatives. So now that I know that it, it works and it's out there, um, I, I definitely think we'll be using it again. It's going to create a whole host of issues. Not so fast says Georgia State University ethics law professor Jessica Sino. It is the Wild West uh, a, a little bit because there is no regulation. Some users like Jesse do opt in to allow law enforcement to use their DNA profile. But Sino says that's not always the case. Law enforcement still has ways around it to access your DNA information. Without formal uniform guidelines, it can leave consumers and the integrity of the criminal cases vulnerable. And I think a lot of law enforcement agencies are going to be blindsided by this. Yes, maybe a relative committed a crime, but you may have also just found out that that person is adopted or perhaps a parent had an affair. So there's so many, you know, familial issues. But the state of Georgia isn't even discussing the FGG concern. The chair of the State Public Safety Committee told The Reveal he couldn't answer questions about how lawmakers on his committee can protect Georgians, or if they even should. District attorneys like Schieffer are not opposed to some regulation, as long as it allows them to still do their jobs. We're going to start to see it more and more and more, and we'll need to resolve some of those issues, if we can, on the front end instead of... Um, you know, dealing with that in the court system on the back end. I think that strikes like a good balance, you know, so people feel confident that they're safe, that they have their privacy. Weeks since her DNA helped police crack a 40-year-old rape and murder. The suspect is still waiting for his day in court, and Jesse hopes her role in this investigation can help Helene's family heal. That family that has been wondering for 40 years who killed their daughter, now they have an answer. The CEO of 23andMe recently announced they were laying off 14% of their employees because the market is shrinking and people are concerned about their privacy and the ethical issues. You can see more in-depth investigations like this one by going to our website, 11alive.com. And don't forget to watch The Reveal, the only local investigative show in the nation, Sundays at 6 on our sister station, 11 Alive. All right, Faith, thanks a lot. A massive fire that shut down Interstate 85 for hours. Has a lot of folks out there asking why Georgia interstates do not have trucks only lanes. Our why guy is answering that question next. And the impeachment trial is drawing to a close what each say, side had to say during closing arguments today. <laughs> throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a new yeah. way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. So what's the best part about Uplink? Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together, we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, and they cliffhangers. Would, you know, they didn't ah. wait the next week. You're all, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive.
Atlanta. Almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Live's Chesley McNeil. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say you won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. newscast not enough for you get even more at 11 alive's youtube channel where you'll find uncut interviews extended body cam footage live Welcome back, everyone. You know, this weekend's fiery crash on Interstate 85 prompted an 11 Alive viewer to ask why our interstate do not, states do not have lanes to separate truck traffic from the rest of us. Some commuters believe if truck drivers have their own lanes, it would prevent a lot of major accidents out there. Well, the Department of Transportation agrees separating truck traffic from passenger vehicles would improve safety. In fact, there are plans to add truck-only lanes to sections of Interstate 75. GDOT says it's feasible in some areas, but maybe not in others. Our Y guy, Jerry Carnes, is looking into it. They are a vital part of Atlanta's economic heartbeat. There is no route through our city that is free from the tractor-trailer trucks delivering goods throughout Metro Atlanta. They keep the money flowing, but sometimes they bring our traffic to a halt. It's crazy out there. It really is. Scenes like this are part of the argument for lanes that take truck traffic away from the everyday commuter. I think they need their own highway. At least 45% of people on the highway that's driving cars are scared of them. GDOT plans to build truck-only lanes along a 40-mile stretch of I-75 from Macon to McDonough. There are commuters who want to know why there are no plans to take them through Metro Atlanta. GDOT tells us that the truck-only lanes make sense in the area south of town. Truck traffic is on the rise in that area. There is room to build added lanes. In Metro Atlanta, it's a different situation. While commercial truck traffic is heavy here, GDOT tells us they're not sure where they would build lanes reserved exclusively for those trucks. There are already express lanes along the metro area's multi-lane highways with more to come. With businesses and homes located close to the interstates, GDOT says there's little room for more. While truck-only lanes are planned south of town and you could see more around the state in the future, GDOT says it's doubtful you'll see them moving through the city. All right, so once built, Georgia's truck-only lanes will be among the first in the country. Construction south of town is scheduled to begin in 2024 and could take four years to complete. GDOT will determine if there's anything similar or feasible in other parts of our state. So what do you think of those temperatures today? You know, we started off this morning in the 40s. That was still cool, but a little above the average. We should be in the 30s for this time of year. But look at the afternoon hours. After starting off in those 40s, let's see, it's 4 at uh, 7 o'clock, it was 43 degrees. And then by 9, it was 47. 54 at 10, 60 at 11. Didn't stop there. 67 at 12, 72 at 1, and then up to 76 at 4 o'clock. That was our high temperature today, which tied the record. And then it has really stayed mild throughout the rest of the evening hours with temperatures down to 65 degrees out there right now at the 9 o'clock hour. And remember, the average high for this time of year is 54. So even at this late hour, we are still much warmer than what we should be in a normal afternoon here at the beginning of February. So we have the mild air that's in place over us right now, and that's going to stick with us for the next couple of days. We're also going to see not only the mild air, but the moisture that's going to start building in to give us some rain chances. On Tuesday, it's a low chance. 
Wednesday and then especially Wednesday night into Thursday. We'll see more showers and even the potential for storms. And that's going to be from the clash of the air masses when you have this very mild air and then cold air back behind this system that's going to be coming our way behind a cold front. That's what's going to trigger not only more rain that could be heavy, but also the potential for some storms late Wednesday and into Thursday. And then after that moves out, it'll cool off a little bit once we get toward the end of the week on Friday, also into Saturday with our temperatures that will go back into the 50s with lows in the 30s. And then we start getting mild again once we get into next week with temperatures by Monday going back on Sunday and Monday going back up to around 60 degrees. So just know more ups and downs are ahead for our area. Now we mentioned that rain risk that's going to begin tomorrow with a low rain chance, but then really our better rain chances are Wednesday, th Wednesday and Thursday where we could see some flooding and that's why there's this flood watch in effect for areas of North Georgia as far south as the Rome area, uh, Bartow County there at Cartersville, also into Cherokee County uh, near Cumming, Georgia and Forsyth County, Gainesville Hall County is included, also into Banks County as well. That line up to the north, Jackson County are in it. Uh, that's where we have that flood watch in effect. We're also watching the severe weather risk that tomorrow is going to be to the west of us. And then on Wednesday, uh, the strongest storms we think will be in South Alabama and the Florida Panhandle, but we will have a level one risk coming in from the south and west, south and west of Atlanta with damaging winds and heavy rainfall possible. And then on Thursday with this system, the severe weather risk slides over to the east. Now, we will have a chance for some strong storms here in metro Atlanta, but we think the strongest activity will be over to the east later in the day on Thursday with damaging winds, maybe some isolated uh, tornadoes with that as well. So on the wasometer for Tuesday, our scale from 1 to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day, we're going with a 6. As clouds increase, we'll see a rain chance and high temperatures still above average, but not as warm as it was today. It'll be at about 68. 70 on Wednesday. Uh, as more rain comes in and even those storms possible late Wednesday and through the day on Thursday, highs near 65 Thursday and then Friday, that's when we clear out and the cooler air returns with lows in the 30s, highs in the 50s, lows in the 30s again Saturday, highs in the 50s with only a 20% chance for an isolated shower and then dry Sunday and Monday, 59 Sunday up to 62 by next Monday with uh, a 10 on the wasometer. Stay with us as we continue with prime time on the ATL. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a new yeah. way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. So what's the best part about Uplink? Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. Together, we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together, we are unstoppable. Together, we are where Atlanta speaks. Remember the old days, the old cliffhangers when we used to watch shows? Hey, cliffhangers. You know, they would wait the next week. You're all, oh, what's going to happen to the $6 million man? He was hanging with his one bionic arm. Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Alive's Chesley McNeil. I'm going to give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. 
Come on, man. It's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home. From different backgrounds, languages, and religions, and who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot, full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. All right, those rain chances coming up the next few days. Storm risk Wednesday and Thursday. Then we dry out and cool off for the end of the week. Okay, we got more primetime news coming up with Jeff and Aisha. And of course, I'll see you back on our sister station on 11 Alive for Up Late. Have a good night. For every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us. Use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from 5 to 7 on The Morning Rush on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire yeah. week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, <laughs> on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, Auntie. No. <laughs> Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you have to do what I say. I'm no, 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 You can assume what you're doing, but be the man. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. <laughs> So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. But first tonight, new numbers, new restrictions, and new fears about the coronavirus. The CDC is calling this an unprecedented threat. There have been 20,000 cases reported of the coronavirus in China with 425 deaths here in the United States, 11 known cases.
Two of those people were infected by household members who had been traveling to China. And very strict travel restrictions are now in effect. Any American citizen or family member that has been to China over the past 14 days will be redirected to one of 11 hospitals for a full CDC screening. And of course, that can be a very worrisome issue here for people in the United States who have family and friends visiting and working in China. Hope Forward talked to an Atlanta woman fearful for her family there in China. Lee Durden is in Metro Atlanta with her two sons, but the father of her boys and much of their family is in Beijing. She's worried at any moment one of them might become infected with the coronavirus. I do worry that something like that may happen and that the boys would lose someone or that someone would become sick in our family. Hai Junge, the boy's father, told her emotions continue to rise in China. In Beijing, cases of the coronavirus jumped from 51 to 212 in the last week. They're especially fearful for babies and younger children. Obviously, they have a large population of elderly people. Because of China's strict media and internet laws, there's still a lot of unknown for people living in the hardest hit areas. Dr. Diana Adama is a U.S. citizen living in Wuhan. She's nervous and frustrated. How do I feel about being here and locked in with no information and dwindling supplies? I feel extremely horrible. Both Adama and Durden say those who don't have the virus are emotionally drained from what's happening around them. Durden's sons go to Beijing every summer to reunite with their father, but if things don't get better by April, both parents agreed to keep their sons right here in Metro Atlanta. All right, thank you, Hope. So the coronavirus has financial experts on alert, keeping their eyes on the stock market and investments. Major U.S. companies like Starbucks and Apple are already seeing the effects of the virus. Financial experts at East Paces Group in Atlanta believe if the spread of the virus doesn't slow down, everyday people will start to feel it too. Workers in China that are not working and you've got a huge manufacturing hub that's going to be affected. Um, and, and production levels are obviously potentially going to go down because of it. Your 401ks, your IRAs, your investments, um, you know, with when rates change, your fixed income investments uh, are affected. Experts say right now you'll likely see the effects of the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, the major industrial stocks, especially those that have some sort of relationship with China. There are so many questions about the coronavirus on the 11 Alive Facebook page. Be sure to check out 11alive.com and download the 11 Alive app for the latest information coming straight from the CDC. A controversial police beating in Gwinnett County captured on cell phone video. You may remember three years ago, the videos all over social media, both officers fired and arrested. Now the testimony is set to begin in the trial of one of the officers. As for the other officer, he is going to take the stand against the officer who is on trial. Tonight, John Shirick on this case of cop versus cop. Two Gwinnett County police officers at a traffic stop. One officer slams his forearm into the face of the driver he had just pulled over. The driver insisting he was surrendering. Then the other officer runs up after the driver is down and handcuffed and kicks him in the head. Both officers fired. But the first officer, Michael Bongiovanni, is the one who got the deal from prosecutors. No prison time. He just has to testify against the other officer, Robert McDonald, who now faces possibly 26 years in prison. As a victim of unnecessary force um, at the hands of police. As jury selection began in McDonald's trial, McDonald's attorney, Walt Britt, was telling prospective jurors that the unarmed man who was beaten that April day in 2017, Demetrius Hollins, seen here along with his injuries soon after the incident, was not seriously hurt. Demetrius B. Hollins sustained superficial injuries to his face. Prosecutor Sharissa Henrich rose to object to that defense characterization. Both sides seeking jurors with no access to grind against police. Jurors, once they are chosen in the next day or two, who will have to decide which officer to believe, the one who has already pleaded guilty, or the one on trial who insists he did everything by the book. Another big story we're following for you today. Prosecutors will not seek the death penalty for two people accused of killing a Clark Atlanta student. Jordan Jones and her boyfriend, Baron Blantley, were indicted last week in the death of Alexis Crawford. Crawford was Jones's roommate. Investigators say Jones and Brantley killed Crawford on Halloween, then dumped her body in a Decatur park. Brantley is accused of sexually assaulting Crawford a few days before she was killed. 
This case and the violent details shock so many of our viewers and people all around the country. But when we asked the Fulton County District Attorney's Office if it will seek the death penalty for Brantley or Jones, the answer was no. Not surprising, given it has become increasingly rare in Georgia to impose a death sentence. Three stolen luxury cars worth nearly half a million dollars found behind a Buford Highway Motel. Ron Jones breaks down how these beautiful automobiles ended up there. Check out these beautiful luxury cars, a couple of Maseratis and a Rolls Royce. All three vehicles were confirmed stolen out of Texas. These three guys, Julian Callahan of Caddy, Texas, Lester Price Jr. of Houston, and Ives Amacon of Snailville, are accused of having these stolen beauties in Brookhaven. Police say they're worth nearly $400,000. So where do you hide fancy high-priced stolen cars like these? Local motels and hotels. APD gave Brookhaven police a tip the cars would be in the area. The three men were arrested near the cars at a motel last Friday. Did they give up without a fight? Well, luckily they did. They were shipped off to the DeKalb County Jail. A woman is behind bars tonight accused of shooting and killing a mother at a Super Bowl party in southwest Atlanta. 26-year-old Rochelle Facey is in the Fulton County Jail. Police say the shooting stemmed from a fight at the party on Fairburn Road yesterday. Police have not released the victim's name, but family members identified her as Tashika Sims. Four Georgia communities claim Airbnb owes them money. The Atlanta Business Chronicle reports Cartersville, Rome, Tybee Island, and Hart County are suing the short-term rental company for failing to collect and remit taxes owed to the municipalities. They are also asking the federal court to certify this as a class action lawsuit. Another fire on I-85 today, just two days after that massive tanker fire shut down the interstate for hours on Saturday morning. Police say the fire today was caused by somebody in a stolen Dodge Charger who slammed into the back of another car near Jimmy Carter Boulevard this morning. The other car flipped over, then caught fire. The man in the stolen Charger then ran away. Police still looking for him tonight. Everybody else involved in this crash expected to be okay, but man, oh man, it does get your attention. The situation resolved much faster than Saturday's fire, which shut down part of the interstate for 10 hours. I don't know if we've ever really seen anything like that. A fuel tanker truck crashed and flipped over, then burst into flames. You could see smoke for miles. Two people sadly died in the crash. The fuel from the tanker then spread into the sewer drains along Crescent, and people say they could see explosions coming from nearby manholes. It was a scene out of the apocalypse, wasn't it? Rescuers not only evacuated drivers, but nearby businesses as well. The video, the pictures, they are really something that everybody's been talking about today. This cleanup and repair took hours, but a great job by all of the emergency responders. Elvin Lopez talked to GDOT today about the quick response to the fire and why workers were able to reopen the road a lot sooner than they expected. GDOT says the reason why the repair work was done so quickly was because the fuel had not soaked the road the way they anticipated. When we were thinking initially that it would be 8, 10, 12 hours of road closure, the whole thing was based off of what, how deep that the diesel fuel had run into the asphalt and then also on how big of area we had to repair for that time. GDOT workers said they didn't know what to expect when they first arrived on scene and saw a truck on fire. When you start dealing with tractor trailers, you never know what's on the vehicle, and that's one of the things when the fire department rolled in, None of us had any idea what was on that trailer. Police say the Freightliner truck was pulling a fuel tanker with 8,500 pounds of fuel. The truck driver, Jonas Worku, apparently unable to stop before he hit Emerald Lynn's car, which was stopped in a right-hand lane from a separate accident. When the semi hit the car, they both burst into flames, killing both drivers. Police say the fuel then made its way into the drainage system, sparking multiple fires nearby and putting other drivers at risk. But they had to evacuate the cars uh, because they felt that they was in danger as well. Drivers jumping over the median, some leaving their cars behind, many stranded for hours while emergency crews got to work, clearing the wreckage and repaving the lanes. The repair work going faster than expected. As we took the layers off, we was pleased to, to note that the diesel fuel only penetrated the top inch and a half layer. Completely clearing all lanes on I-85, Barnes says it's a sign of the crew's quick response, a true team effort, all done to keep others safe. 
The tanker fire had a lot of viewers wondering why there are no truck only lanes in Atlanta. Our Y guy Jerry Carnes looking into that for us tonight. He will have answers coming up in the next 30 minutes. We have dry weather conditions out there right now, but rain is just off to the west. Doesn't look that impressive now, but this is going to become impressive and it is moving our way. Stay with us. We'll talk about not only rain chances, the areas that have a flood watch and who could see severe storms. More on that coming up. They take places in gyms, churches and even homes. The Iowa caucuses are happening tonight and historically indicate how candidates will do in the long term. We explain how they work next. And that's why there's the Rush Blog, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Blog on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foyne Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hot spots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pristy, eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibes. When you vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2000. Tonight, the first test for Democratic presidential hopefuls, the but, Iowa caucus. But the process there is a bit different than it is here in Georgia. It doesn't involve anything like a voting booth, and it can even happen inside someone's home. Jennifer Bellamy has a look at how a caucus works in Iowa. Well, you guys, it is certainly a big day in Iowa, and as decisions that are made tonight, well, they could really lead to some of the 11 remaining Democratic candidates to drop out of the race. Now, caucuses work differently depending on your political party, and most people will be focused on the Democratic race tonight. But as you said, it's not just a simple vote on a ballot that determines the process. Churches, schools, libraries, and living rooms. No voting booths, and you have to be on time or you can't participate. That's just the beginning of the Iowa caucus. The Democratic caucus is based on discussions. After hearing from the candidates, supporters split up into different groups and work to move anyone who's undecided to their team. Then there's a count, with organizers looking to candidates who gather at least 15 percent of support in that particular location. Those groups are considered viable and can remain, but those who don't reach that mark must decide to join others, try and increase their numbers, declare themselves undecided, or go home. It's called a realignment. The numbers are then recounted, delegates are assigned, and results are reported. Republicans, on the other hand, use secret ballot to declare their choice. Ballots are counted and participants head home. Delegates are then filtered to national convention delegates. And since President Trump has little opposition for the Republican nomination, that caucus isn't as important to follow. As for the Democrats, the winner will be the candidate who gets the most state delegate equivalents after that realignment process. Tonight, Democrats in Iowa expect to top their 2008 record turnout when they say nearly 240,000 people took part. And while she won't be caucusing herself, Atlanta Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is in Iowa as well. She posted these pictures on Twitter supporting her pick for the White House. That's former Vice President Joe Biden. What a spectacular weather day. My only regret is I had to be here at work. That's no offense to any of you watching right now, but I wanted to be <laughs> out of doors wandering around Piedmont Park. I know. I share that same sentiment. It came so early. It was such a great February surprise, but hopefully 
our viewers got to soak it up, Chris. <laughs> yeah, I hope so, because we tied a record today. It got up to 76 degrees this afternoon. The record for today's date is also 76. That was set in 1995, so nice and warm. A little preview of spring, but we still have a lot of winter to get through Though Spring has not sprung yet. This was just a little teaser of that. We have dry weather conditions out there right now, but I want to show you the system that's going to be moving our way. And this is where we have the rain. It's not that impressive right now through parts of Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, southern Missouri, western Tennessee, up into Kentucky, southern Indiana, uh, and over into Ohio as well. And this is just some light rain, but this is going to become more impressive as it starts to move over to the east and become heavier. We'll even have some storms developing with this as well as it moves into Georgia. Still going to take a couple of days though for that to happen. Let me break down for you what we're watching out there for tonight. Uh, we do have a flood watch in effect. This is not for tonight. This is for Wednesday through Friday morning when the rain moves through. Some of it could be heavy and we think it'll be heavier for North Georgia. As of right now, Atlanta is not in this watch. We're thinking right now based on the computer model guidance that we have is that the heaviest rain will be up to the north. Maybe in these spots three to five inches of rain possible and that could cause minor or moderate flooding in those areas with that heavy rain Wednesday and Thursday. So this stretches from the Rome area through Cartersville uh, through parts of Cherokee County for Scythe County. Uh, Hall County, Jackson and Banks County, that line up to the north, all of those counties, that's where we'll have the heaviest rain. And just watch some flood prone areas for Wednesday and Thursday that we can see some rising water. Now, there's also going to be a severe weather threat developing from that system. Tomorrow, that threat is a marginal risk or level one of five risk uh, through this area here, through parts of western Tennessee northwestern parts of Mississippi, Arkansas, and northern Louisiana. But we don't we're not worried about severe weather here, even though we're going to have a few showers developing. We just don't think they'll be strong. Then on Wednesday, that's when things start to crank in just a little bit. And that severe weather threat is higher down in South Alabama, the Florida Panhandle. But then we'll begin to see the marginal risk or the level one of five risk coming into areas west and southwest of Atlanta and south of Atlanta with damaging wind gust, heavy rainfall possible. Then late Wednesday night, and into Thursday, as the whole system moves through, we will have another chance for strong thunderstorms. These maybe with some damaging wind gusts and isolated tornadoes. As of right now, the Storm Prediction Center is giving what the equivalent of a, a category two of five storm risk from Atlanta really over to the east of us during the latter part of the day here on Thursday. But really, I don't want you to get caught up just on who exactly is in that yellow area because all of us have that potential for some strong storms late Wednesday and into Thursday. Watch these temperatures staying mild only in the 50s overnight and in the morning it's going to be a mild start with those clouds around. We're going to go with the six on the wisometer, low of 52, high of 68 tomorrow with clouds building and those rain chances coming up. Not huge tomorrow. We're just talking about a 40% chance for scattered showers here you see in the afternoon, not a widespread coverage of that rain. And then on Wednesday, scattered showers early on Wednesday. And then in the afternoon, not much going on. It's going to be late Wednesday when this main area of rain slides in. This is late Wednesday night overnight into early on Thursday, those bands of moderate to heavy rain. And that's where we can see some of those thunderstorms that could produce some damaging winds and again, maybe an isolated tornado. So we'll keep you posted. We're going to fine tune those impacts for you over the next few days and the timing too. Once all that rain gets out of here, we will clear out on Friday, cooling off as well with lows near 37 and a high of 51. 30s again Saturday morning with a high of 56 with a very low rain chance at 20%. Excuse me, and then dry again Sunday and Monday, warming back up to 62 by Monday. Hey, take a look at our wow weather moment of the day. We've had a lot of wow weather moments the past few days. So beautiful. This is a um, picture that was sent in by one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers, Tommy Cook. And this is from the Sweetwater Creek State Park uh, over the weekend. Really, really beautiful weather. And uh, we had some great sunset pictures tonight as well. We would love for you to be able to share your pictures with us. The easiest way to do that is to be a part of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. Uh, on Facebook, just search 11 Alive Storm Trackers, ask to become a member, we'll approve you, and then you can be a part of this exclusive local weather community. If you're caught speeding through a school zone, you might end up with a ticket in the mail. That's thanks to new traffic cameras set up near an elementary school in Roswell. Latasha Givens has more tonight. Traffic cameras like these have now been placed around the school zone near Vickery Mill Elementary on Alpharetta Street in Roswell. 
a decision made after police say Georgia became the fifth deadliest state for pedestrian accidents. It's horrible. I mean, drivers have to be very careful and mindful. Roswell police say the traffic cameras will start recording one hour before school starts until one hour after school is over. Monday marks the first day of a 30 day warning period. Roswell police will only issue warnings to drivers traveling 10 miles or more over the posted speed limit. But on March 3rd, any driver caught on camera speeding will be issued a $75 citation in the mail. I think it's lovely. Thomas Wilkes says drivers speeding by the school happens far too much. Call it slow traffic. I live out here. I see it every day. A study by the AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety says children and young adults have less than a 10% chance of suffering a serious injury in an accident that happens at 15 miles per hour. The study says the risks go up substantially if cars are traveling faster, with a 50% risk of serious injury or death at 35 miles per hour. While most parents want drivers to be cautious, some parents think there's a better way. I don't think that's great. Why don't you think it's great? Because um, the technology is still not there for me. Visa L says the technology is not dependable enough to issue tickets that lead to fines. He says more signage and safety patrols are a better option. I think that might help um, instead of putting all this new technology there. I'm Francesca Emmerker with the A Scene. We've got a behind the scenes look at Chris Pratt's new movie, The Tomorrow War. It's filming in Fayetteville. I got all the details for you coming up in the A Scene. Out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Little Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel it's good vibe. We vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> and they're convenient. Fun. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel like thing. we have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. What's the best part about Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together, our voices grow. All right, folks, you know what time it is. You see your screen. It is time for Monday's edition of the A Scene, and we are kicking off with a little behind the scenes action thanks to our very own Cheryl Preheim. Yep, guess what? She was out in Fayetteville recently and may have just come across the secret filming location for the new Chris Pratt movie, The Tomorrow War. Now, here's the video that she actually posted on her Twitter. You can see military tents and military vehicles, green screens that are massive, light panels, and guess what? At night, she even saw actors in the 
field. Now this is going down right outside of Pinewood Studios and word on the street is this could be for Chris Pratt's new movie called Tomorrow War. We will keep our fingers crossed for a set visit and of course we'll make sure Cheryl continues to scour Fayetteville for more. <laughs> Next, you won't believe what Atlanta rapper Ludacris has just done for a special group of students in Florida. According to NBC Miami, he gifted the students at a South Florida high school with $75,000 worth of music equipment. Yep, it's part of StubHub's Ticket Forward program. Now this is actually a collaboration with a foundation that plans to invest $3 million in public school music programs nationwide. We see you, Luda. And congratulations to Sister Circle's very own co-host, Selena Johnson. She just released her new album, Woman, and hosted an intimate listening session on Friday. Now, during a Q&A session, she actually dished on her health journey and getting back into the recording booth. So congratulations to her. All right, good stuff. Thanks, Fran. Well, that's my cue to head out to get ready for Up Late coming up in about 35 minutes on 11 Alive. So if you are up later, join myself and Ron Jones. We'll be there with more news and weather. We'll miss you about 35 minutes away. We'll see you Thank on you. 11 Alive. See you tomorrow. Thanks, I should see you tomorrow. Coming up on the ATL, the Big 36, the impeachment trial is drawing to a close. What each side had to say during closing arguments today. We'll be right back. Bye. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Babe, where are my keys? Uh, where's my lunch? Where's my phone? Hey, where's my blue shirt? Where's my pen? Have you seen it? Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. You know, like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go. Oh, and Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Auntie. No. <laughs> Auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. <laughs> I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boyle Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos to discover. He did it his way. Personalized for you. And that's what makes it so special. The 11 Alive app. Available now in the App Store. Hey, I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So you just do what I say. I'm no, 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 You can assume what you're doing with freedom. Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, it's in my drafts. That's my bad. <laughs> So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Oh, I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've like got the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess. I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, 
live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. So much of the debate over officer-involved shootings uh, usually focus on whether the use of force was justified or not. But Chief Investigator Brendan Keefe is expo exploring another question. Why do some officers heroically try to save suspects they've shot while others simply wait for an ambulance? Shut the vehicle off, put your hands outside the window, I'm not going to ask you again. Some officers go above and beyond the call. He's dead, dude. Oh, he's still got a try. He doesn't want to get the last one. Including right here in Atlanta, where officers now carry tourniquets to save each other and the suspects they've just shot. Hey, stay with me, stay with me. <laughs> Sometimes it's a life sentence versus a death sentence. You don't belong here. Blake Peacock was shot by a sheriff's deputy in Bleckley County, Georgia. They didn't render any aid. Central shot fired. Have EMS rolling. Sheriff's deputies called for an ambulance within seconds, but then stood over Blake Peacock as he gasped for air face down. Like they shot a deer. They don't even turn him over. He's fell on his face. They called the EMS right away. They called for an ambulance. What should they have done next? Now this is an injured human being. I think they should have tried to use any form of life-saving training that they had uh, to save my son. Mm -hmm. Brendan, did the father sue the deputies in this case? Cheryl, he did, but not for wrongful death. The officers were cleared in the shooting itself. He sued for deliberate indifference. Did that work? What did the court say? A federal judge actually dismissed the case, saying police officers have no legal duty to provide first aid. All they have to do is call an ambulance. The U.S. Supreme Court issued a similar ruling. I think a lot of people might be surprised to learn that. So do other police departments have different rules? Do they have to give aid if someone's in front of them needing medical help? They do. The Atlanta Police Department requires it, for example, but it really depends on the culture of each department. Only one state requires police officers to provide medical aid by law. That's Washington State huh. after a referendum by voters was passed there. All right. I know you're going to have more tonight at 11. That's right. On Up Late, we're going to look at this issue and we're going to also answer some of your questions and comments that right. you're seeing online. And you can always see more of Brendan's investigation Sundays at 6 p.m. on The Reveal. World health officials continue to fight coronavirus in China. The first of two new hospitals now is taking in patients. It was built in less than 10 days. The Chinese government says it's needed to combat the outbreak. So far, coronavirus has infected tens of thousands, killed at least 360 across China since early December. A viewer called the station connecting coronavirus to Lysol spray, and it is creating a conversation online. 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks, so we set out to verify for you. The post is making the rounds, and the user points out that Lysol can uh, mention coronavirus and claim it's proof that the government knew about the virus before the outbreak started. So is it true? Did Lysol know about the virus before the outbreak occurred? According to researchers at the University of Pennsylvania, no. They want to remind people that the word coronavirus is not specific and that it encompasses numerous strands of the virus, strands that existed before the recent outbreak, which is why uh, you see the word on products like Lysol and Clorox. So while the Lysol can contain the word coronavirus, it does not refer to the new strain that originated in China. So can Lysol help increase your chances of staying healthy against the strain? We reached out to our medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy. She says when used as directed, Lysol is able to kill viruses and bacteria. Hand sanitizers with at least 60% alcohol is also effective. However, the most effective way to fight germs, washing your hands with soap and warm water. More than 1,000 Delta employees want to join a lawsuit against the company that makes the airline's uniforms. According to our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle, right now there are three lawsuits against Land's End for their passport plum uniforms. Employees say the clothes makes them sick and gives them rashes. Delta says it's changing its uniform in 2021. In the meantime, employees can opt out to wear other uniform options. Police are searching for the man who punched a 76-year-old in the middle of a Gwinnett County Kroger. This is surveillance video. You can see two men walk into a Kroger in Decula. That is when one of the men punches the other 
in the back of the head. The victim, a 76-year-old man, he is okay. Police say the altercation came moments after the victim asked the suspect to move his car from the fire lane. If you recognize the guy who threw the punch, you are asked to call police. Two women are dead. A child is injured following a shooting at a freshman dormitory in Texas. It happened at Texas A&M Commerce. University police found the two women dead inside a dorm room. A young child was also in the room but is in stable condition. Investigators believe that everybody involved knew each other, but they haven't said how the shooting occurred. The school is about 65 miles northeast of Dallas. There is uneasiness in a Peachtree City church over the weekend after they found a loaded gun, a rifle on the property. Police say the AR-15 was hidden under a jacket in the chapel area of Holy Trinity Catholic Church. Nick Sturdivan explains how police figured out who left it there. Sunday Mass was back on here at Holy Trinity Catholic Church with Peachtree City police officers nearby. After police say this loaded semi-automatic AR-15 platform rifle was found inside the chapel the day before. It does not deter people from coming to church. Um, this church in particular, they have a very good security system. They have a closed circuit camera system here. You can see the cameras in the parking lot. There are cameras throughout the, the campus and the property. Investigators say a church member spotted the rifle underneath a jacket in Inside the chapel. The church canceled mass Saturday night after officers arrived. Investigators making this discovery Sunday morning. Fortunately, uh, we were able to identify the owner of the rifle, uh, made contact with him, and it was discovered that a female subject that resides with this individual uh, has uh, mental illness. Police say she told investigators that she was uncomfortable with the rifle in the home, so she decided to leave the rifle at the church where she believed it would be handled safely. Officers believe she did not intend to use it. You know, we always preach the whole, if you see something, say something. Uh, the location that this rifle was actually located was not in it, you know, out in the open and obvious. This was somebody that truly took the extra step to pay attention to their surroundings, identified something out of place. We do encourage people to go to law enforcement when they, you know, if you have a weapon and you need to get rid of it, we would encourage you to go to law enforcement. But, um, you know, father has a good relationship with this community. Investigators are talking with the Fayette County District Attorney's Office about any possible charges. The 2020 presidential race officially gets underway with the Iowa caucus tonight and Lyft wants to help get you there. The ride sharing service expanding its voting access program. It will provide riders with free or discounted rides to the polls through the entire primary calendar and the general election. Lyft also says it partnered with several nonprofits to identify and distribute rides to those most in need. Today marks the beginning of the end of President Trump's impeachment trial with both sides delivering their closing arguments. The floor now opens to senators for speeches defending why they think the president should be acquitted or convicted before casting a final vote on Wednesday afternoon. NBC's Alice Barr in Washington with the very latest. The Senate will come For the order. first time in the impeachment trial of President Trump, senators who've sat as silent jurors are giving their take, with all eyes on a few centrists, like red state Democrat Joe Manchin, who would not say if he'll vote to remove the president, but did introduce a resolution to censure him. And censure would allow a bipartisan statement condemning his unacceptable behavior in the strongest terms. The floor speeches coming after House managers and the president's lawyers gave one last pitch to sway senators. How many falsehoods can we take? The House managers bear the very heavy burden of proof. They did not meet it. The Senate preparing for a final vote on Wednesday when the Republican majority is all but certain to acquit the president. Closing arguments in Washington coming just as presidential election season opens today in Iowa. The answer is elections, not impeachment. House managers calling on senators to protect those elections, arguing President Trump tried to influence the results by pressuring Ukraine to investigate the Bidens and that he'll do it again. The president continues his wrongdoing unchecked and unashamed. Despite this last push, Democrats effectively lost their case on Friday when Republicans united to block witnesses and documents. A few Republican senators conceding the president's actions were inappropriate, but not enough to remove him from office. If you find that the House has proved its case and still vote to acquit, your name will be tied to his with a cord of steel and for all of history. Senators now defending their positions before casting their final votes into history.
A massive fire that shut down I-85 for hours has many asking why Georgia interstates don't have truck-only lanes. Our Y guy is answering that question coming up next. And we had record tying temperatures out there today, but things are about to change. Not only is it going to get wet, but we have the potential for some storms around. We're going to talk about the timing coming up. Falcons moving on from Vic Beasley. What a shame. He uh, just didn't get it done in Atlanta, and maybe he'll have another opportunity somewhere else. We'll talk about that coming up. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. <laughs> It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip hop legends. News of the mural went viral when Big Boy himself gave a shout out on Instagram. You can find it tucked away in a back parking lot in Lil Five Points. An Atlanta icon, ever changing, always interesting. The Crog Street Tunnel is full of artwork from some pretty eclectic Atlanta artists. You always feel as good vibe. We vibe with it, it's a good time. We don't worry about the hate, we just pass it to the side. There's graffiti, community messages, concert announcements. You really never know what you're gonna get here, and that's what makes it so special. You can find it between Cabbage Town and Inman Park. If you've never checked it out, it's a must see. There are hundreds of works of art along the Beltline. I'm talking murals, sculptures, photography. This beautiful mural was created by the artist Hintz. It's 100 feet long, and even though it was created in 2014, it still remains very popular to musicians and photographers alike. You can find it on the East Side Trail under Virginia Avenue. So let me know what you think. It doesn't have to be street art. Maybe your favorite spot is down the street from your home or a great view. Connect with me on Facebook and Instagram and share your favorite Instagram spots in Atlanta. And come hang out with me on Morning Rush, weekdays 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Televised newscast not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? It looks like fun. It they does. are fun. <laughs> they're and they're convenient. Yeah. But they're being dumped everywhere. 5,000 scooters at one time active throughout the city. I enjoy them myself. They're fun. Yeah. There's got to be some regulations. That's I just feel the like thing. they have to evolve with the times, though. They're not mm -hmm. going anywhere. They shouldn't go anywhere. It's a yeah. new way of transporting. Yeah. We have to evolve. I'm going to be looking for you next time, so use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. You see them all day, every day. Headlines, stats, and numbers, but without context, they're just clickbait. So let's add some perspective. The three most interesting numbers of the day, what they mean, and why they're important. News and numbers on Uplink. Your voice, it is never too loud or too much. Your voice has the power to tell it like it is. Bringing us together to act. Together our voices grow. Together we come alive. Amplifying voices and breaking down barriers to change the story and shape the future. Together we are unstoppable. Together we are where Atlanta speaks. This weekend's fiery crash on I-85 prompted one 11 Alive viewer to ask, why our interstates don't have lanes that separate truck traffic from the rest of the vehicles? Some commuters agree that giving truck drivers their own travel lanes would prevent major accidents like the one experienced on Saturday. The Department of Transportation agrees separating truck traffic from passenger vehicles would improve safety. In fact, there are plans to add truck-only lanes to a section of I-75. GDOT says, it's feasible in some areas, but not others. Our Y guy, Jerry Carnes, looking into it. 
They are a vital part of Atlanta's economic heartbeat. There is no route through our city that is free from the tractor trailer trucks delivering goods throughout Metro Atlanta. They keep the money flowing, but sometimes they bring our traffic to a halt. It's crazy out there. It really is. Scenes like this are part of the argument for lanes that take truck traffic away from the everyday commuter. I think they need their own highway. At least 45% of people on the highway that's driving cars are scared of them. GDOT plans to build truck-only lanes along a 40-mile stretch of I-75 from Macon to McDonough. There are commuters who want to know why there are no plans to take them through Metro Atlanta. GDOT tells us that the truck-only lanes make sense in the area south of town. Truck traffic is on the rise in that area. There is room to build added lanes. In Metro Atlanta, it's a different situation. While commercial truck traffic is heavy here, GDOT tells us they're not sure where they would build lanes reserved exclusively for those trucks. There are already express lanes along the metro area's multi-lane highways with more to come. With businesses and homes located close to the interstates, GDOT says there's little room for more. While truck-only lanes are planned south of town and you could see more around the state in the future, GDOT says it's doubtful you'll see them moving through the city. One spill, George's truck-only lanes will be among the first in the country. Construction south of town scheduled to begin in 2024. It'll take four years to complete. GDOT will then determine if anything similar needs to be done in other parts of Georgia. If you have a question for Jerry Carnes, our Y guy, send it to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email. I can't tell you the number of people that have stopped me over the past couple of days with opinions on what transpired on Saturday. A lot. So everybody's talking about it and thinking about it. Let us hear from you. A Forsyth County kindergarten teacher reuniting with a former student after more than a decade to help save her life. 16-year-old Riley Highland was diagnosed four years ago with a liver disease. Her father began sharing Riley's story with his co-workers at North Forsyth Middle School. And that's when he reconnected with one of his daughter's former teachers, Gina Garner. Garner was preparing to donate part of her liver to a relative when she discovered it would no longer be needed. And at the last minute, she got a phone call because of an organ donor. She got a deceased donor. And here I was expecting to share my liver with her and that didn't happen. And at the same time, I'm getting to know Chris, making the connection with Riley. And I just felt like it wasn't a coincidence that I ended up at this school. And so that's why I offered. She is an amazing woman, my goodness. The surgery was set to take place today. We will be following up with the pair. So to hear from Riley's father about the reconnection, you can do that on the My Coming News section of our website. Chris. A lot of folks on my Facebook Live tonight were talking about the beautiful sunset that we had. This is a picture by one of our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers, Michael Druckmann from the Gainesville area. Not only do you see a lot of the orange and pink there on the horizon, but even some purple colors here in the clouds. A really, really beautiful shot there. This is from Lisa Kramer in Johns Creek, also showing the fiery sky that we had tonight. The view there, thanks to some of the clouds at sunset. And then this is from Blake Robb in Carrollton. He launched his drone to get a, a look at the sunset and uh, nice colors there along the horizon too. Now we have those clouds that are building in, but those clouds are not giving us any rain yet. That's going to start coming in the form of scattered showers tomorrow, then a better coverage of rain later Wednesday and into Thursday. Our high today, 76 degrees. Does that seem hot to you? Well, yeah, we should be around 54 at this time of year. Uh, so we are 22 degrees above the average, and that ties the record for today's date. The record is 76, set in 1995. Uh, we didn't have any rain around today. We still have a surplus about three and a third inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. We're going to see more rain coming in, though, for this week, and that's going to make that surplus rise a little bit more. It's dry out there right now, and the system that we're watching is just generating a few showers out to the west uh, through parts of Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, into Kentucky as well. More of that stretches back into uh, Texas. This whole system is going to be moving our way, but it's going to start hitting a little more energy, build up more moisture and cause a storm threat to our west for the next couple of days and then eventually into our area late Wednesday to Thursday. We're going to see some significant rain too, and so the Weather Service 
has issued a flood watch for North Georgia, including some North Metro counties like Floyd County and Rome, also into parts of Bartow County, Cherokee County, Forsyth County, Hall County, Jackson, Banks counties. That line up to the north. These are the areas that could see between uh, three and five inches of rain on Wednesday and Thursday, and that could cause some flooding in some spots. Now, the system out to the west starts to get its act together a little more tomorrow. They'll have a level one severe weather risk, and then the level two severe weather risk is going to be on Wednesday, South Alabama and the Florida Panhandle. We'll have a marginal risk or level one of five risk coming in closer to west of Atlanta, near Atlanta, and there on the south side too. And then on Thursday, as this passes through Wednesday night, overnight into Thursday, that uh, severe weather risk extends over to the east of us. It would be the equivalent of a level two out of five risk. We're talking about damaging winds possible. Isolated tornadoes, tornadoes aren't out of the question. We're going to be fine tuning those risk areas and the timing and the impacts over the next couple of days, though. That's just what we're seeing right now. So warm still tomorrow, 68, 70 Wednesday with that rain chance going up. 65 Thursday with 100% chance for rain and some of those thunderstorms around. We dry out and cool off on Friday with a high of 51. 56 Saturday with only a 20% chance for a shower late and then still looking pretty good here for Sunday and Monday. Dry weather conditions 59 Sunday 62 by Monday. Next month, free agency begins in the NFL, and today the Falcons announced that they will no longer pursue contract negotiations with defensive end Vic Beasley, meaning his time in Atlanta is officially over. A lot of mock drafts already have the Falcons grabbing a pass rusher in the first round, so we'll pay attention to that when Vegas comes around in the draft in April. All right, the Hawks trying to rebound at home after a tough trip to Dallas over the weekend. Trey Young, he was hitting it from the logo tonight. He secured his 25th 30-plus point game and it was insane. That's third most in the league right now. John Collins also, he's been a walking double-double lately, his 13th in 25 games. All that being said, still not enough in Atlanta tonight. The Hawks lose to Boston 123-115. All right, someone who knows a thing or two about switching teams, Tim Hudson. He spent most of his career, as you know, right here in Atlanta with the Braves. Then he went out west, played for the Giants. Now he's embarking on a brand new job as a pitching coach at his alma mater at Auburn University. I spent some time with Tim over in Auburn and talked about his new role. When it was the end of your Major League Baseball career, did it ever cross your mind that you wanted to switch over and be a coach? I had so many coaches along the way pour into my career and pour into my life, and I just feel like it was something that you know, I wanted to do as well and dabbled in, you know, announcing a little bit and, and, and dabbled in some of that stuff. And I just realized, man, you know what? I think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Jersey locker room dugout guy. You had a couple of stops in your career for Major League Baseball, but you spent the most time in Atlanta as a Brave. What's the biggest takeaway when you reminisce on your time in Atlanta? A new record, 13 strikeouts for Tim Hudson. I grew up a Braves fan. You know, I grew up, you know, watching Tom Glavin and John Smoltz and Greg Maddox, Bobby Cox, Chipper Jones, all these guys, teammates with John Smoltz at the time. I was like, man, this is, you're talking about kind of, you know, feeling a little nervous, you know, I, I looked, I'll probably look to them like they had three heads for a while, just because right. you kind of in awe of some. Chipper was, was unbelievable to be, I mean, that's, you know, switch hitting third baseman all the time. I had a chance to go out west and win a World Series, but, you know, Hart's always in Atlanta. I always feel like I'm that, you know, I'm one of, I'm one of them and, and, and always will be. Talk about the World Series. Were you waiting to win one to end your career? Was that just something you wanted to check off? <laughs> you know, that's an elusive thing for a lot of people. It's funny, you know, so there's a lot of guys who play their whole career and never even have a chance to play in a World Series. But after that, you were like, I think I'm good. Yeah, yeah in, in fact, in 14, after we won the World Series, I mean, I was, I, mean, I was an old guy. I was 30, 39 years old. I remember we flew from Kansas City, was flying back to San Francisco, and I'm, you know, sitting there on the plane, and we're having a good time and celebrating, and I remember, in my mind, I, I, I retired like seven times on that flight <laughs> going going back oh, and, no. and unretired. And I remember talking to my wife. I was like, I think I'm going to retire. I, gotta, I can go out on top. And you met your wife here, so life kind of comes full circle for you. Yeah, she was, she was actually my tutor <laughs> when I was she here. She was your so, tutor? Yeah, you know. So all <laughs> the kids out there, make sure you, you know. Marry your tutor, I guess. Well, I'm just saying, make <laughs> sure you go see your tutor and, and uh, do your work, man. You never know what can happen. Best of luck to Tim Hudson. We'll keep you updated on what he does. We'll be right back. Atlanta, almost 6 million people call the Metro home. But what makes this place so great? I'm 11 Live's Chesley McNeil. I'm gonna give you three reasons why Atlanta is the best city in America. 
Come on, man, it's the heart of the South. And it's one of the most diverse cities around. People from all walks of life have come here and made it home from different backgrounds, languages, and religions. And who can forget about the food? They all make this a cultural melting pot full of great people and Southern hospitality. Atlanta's rich history is unmatched, known as the cradle of the civil rights movement for good reason. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Andrew Young, John Lewis, they all fought in the struggle for equal rights right here. Businesses on Sweet Auburn Avenue, local black churches, and college students from Atlanta all helped shape the future of America. Once an Olympic city, Atlanta's home to the best sports scene across the nation. Hey look, the South has something to say. You won't find more passionate fans anywhere. From the Atlanta Braves home run king, my man, Hank Aaron, to the human highlight film, Hawks' Dominique Wilkins, some of the greatest athletes have come through Atlanta. We're talking the Falcons, the Braves, the Hawks, the MLS champs, Atlanta United. This city has something for every kind of sports fan. So what do you think? Is Atlanta the best city in America? Connect with us, use Facebook or Instagram and tell us why this city's got it going on. And then watch us every weekday morning from five to seven on the Morning Rush on 11 Alive. newscast not enough for you get even more at 11 alive's youtube channel where you'll find uncut interviews extended body cam footage live streams of atlanta's biggest trials and more subscribe to 11 alive today babe where are my keys uh, where's my lunch where's my phone hey where's my blue shirt where's my pen have you seen it Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. I woke up at 2 in the morning to be here. Where were you? Once you allow it, right, then it sets you up for the entire week where you just have lost it. Like on, a, on a Sunday, it's like, oh, let's just order some Chinese food. And of course, you wind up eating tons of that. And then on Monday, you're like, well, I got leftovers. I can't let it go to waste. Auntie wants to give you a plate to take home from the barbecue. Uh, auntie. No. <laughs> auntie, don't invite me to the barbecue. I'm going to be looking for you next time. So use the hashtag and let us know you're hanging out with us. Morning Rush, weekday, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. The 11 Alive app is your go-to source for all things Atlanta. You hear what happened today? I'll tell you all about it. Breaking news the moment it happens. The Boil Water Advisory. Hyper-local, accurate weather alert. You may want to grab that sweater, maybe even a coat. More stories to uncover. More videos. Very warm out there today. It's yeah. going to stay mild the next few days with rain moving in. Maybe storms on Wednesday and Thursday. Thanks for watching The Big 36, where news is king. We always appreciate it. We'll see you I got the ways to go. I got moves to make. Call me, but I stay in the flow. So y'all just do what I say. I'm no, 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 Oh, and so I was saying, there is always something filming here in Atlanta. From movies to TV shows, you name it. And so the A scene keeps up with all of it for you. Casting calls, which big celebrities are in town, what's filming, and if it's in your neighborhood. It's like an inside scoop. Oh, nice. But you know, I really wish you would have told us we were filming this. Today, Ooh, did I not text you? All right. Ah, I sent my drafts. That's my bad. So you slept in and you missed morning rush, huh? Well, here's what you missed. In my experience, good guys do finish last. Mm. Stop. I, I consider nice myself guy. a nice guy. Yeah, I've nice got moment. the most beautiful woman in the world in my eyes. You're a nice guy too, yeah. Jess? I'm saying in my experience, when growing up, good guys didn't oh, finish last. Oh, Somebody <laughs> broke his heart somewhere along the line. We're here every weekday morning, so come on, hang out with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. You didn't get my text? The whole crew got together for coffee this morning. I'm, I'm learning the taste of water, because I'm, I'm sugary. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. About I mean, that. Reward would be 
Slimming, slimming down. Okay, yeah. Yeah, right, yeah, okay. Yeah. A little water yes. in my cup. And, and beautiful skin. Well, you well, know, I even too. more beautiful skin, you know, when it's all <laughs> hydrated and everything else. It's not going to be able to sit next to you in a few months. <laughs> Don't drink your morning coffee alone. Have it with us. Morning Rush, weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m., only on 11 Alive. Some mornings what you want isn't what you have time for. And that's why there's the Rush Block, the biggest news of the day in five minutes or less. Quick and convenient for all those hectic mornings. Catch the Rush Block on the Morning Rush. Everybody has learned how to drive, so I'm going to go ahead and retire. It didn't last long. Crank up your morning rush with Crash Clark. Weekdays, 5 to 7 a.m. on 11 Alive. Traffic brought to you by John Foy and Associates. Atlanta is filled with great photo spots. And of course, I would know because this is my hometown. I'm 11 Alive's Francesca Amaker, and I'm about to show you my picks for the three best Instagram spots in Atlanta. The Outcast mural is one of Atlanta's newest hotspots. Created by the artist Jex, people flock from all over the world just to get a shot of these two hip-hop legends. 